Welcome to the Ashraf Garda show. Um, Ashraf, thank you so much for joining us. And um, just to tell you a little bit <laughs> um, about Ashraf, um, he's doing this for free. First and foremost, he's not charging us a cent for this particular session, and we really appreciate that is the foundation. But he is also the founder of Champion South Africa, and he's the host of the Ashraf Garda Show podcast. He's a professional speaker, a program director, conference moderator, media trainer, webinar host, and you will be able to find this very webinar on his podcast um, after this. Um, so I now hand everything over to Ashraf Gada, and I'm hoping we have these conversations, but at the end, come out with workable solutions, you know, and hold those who are committing to account in the long run. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that, uh, Brucia. A warm, warm welcome to, to each and every one of you. Uh, some of the names I recognize, uh, thanks to Sanctum Sem- Sem- Zoom sessions, you can, you can see people up front. So, uh, I recognize some of you. Thank you for that. The cricketers, some administrators, some people in the media mm-hmm. space. I uh, recognize all of you. Great. Uh, Busi, I, I've been called many things. I, I have never been called lovely. Okay. Um, so I thought I'd just note that. And if you wish to <laughs> tweet that, you can certainly do that. The all important hashtag in this case is racism in sports. Now, I'm saying that because although people can ask questions here, uh, we all know that this is merely a platform for a bigger platform for the vast majority of people on the outside who are not here today. And, and feel free, therefore, not only to comment or to ask questions on, on our chat line just now, but certainly to amplify it, particularly on, on Twitter, but you can do it on other social media platforms, and that hashtag racism in, in sports, okay? So this is the plan, and this is the way I see it. When I was asked to, to get involved, um, a, I, I love cricket. Uh, B, I, I'm a South African who's committed to building my country to a champion nation. That's very much the ethos, ethos of champion South Africa, where we say champion people build champion nations. And for a long time, uh, some of our cricketers have been very much amongst the champion people of our nation. Three, the issue of racism, I think, is, is a big problem in our country, but around the world, and what to do about it. Fourthly, when I get asked to do something and the name Kathrada gets thrown in, then, then you really can't uh, refuse that, right? Because uh, he's passed on, his, his legacy has been an impeccable legacy, and, and he stands for all the great things that, that has made South Africa, even if it's momentarily, uh, it's made it great. So he still represents the type of hope, um, of, of the type of, of effective, sustained leadership that we so desire, desire in, in, in our country. So I uh, appreciate the fact that you're a part of it. Um, let me tell you what's, what's the plan, okay? So we've got three cricketers who, who've played, and I could say for some of them, former cricketers, many may say, if you, even if you retire, you're never really a former cricketer. You've always played the game of cricket, okay? So three cricketers, first up, uh, and we'll get their, their views, their narrative, uh, speaking to this theme of racism in sports, particularly, of course, uh, from their level of experience, which is racism in cricket, if, if anything, okay? Uh, then we will speak to someone that's interesting because he's a former player in the old, in the old Sackbock days or Sack B days, uh, but also then ended up being the, not just a medical doctor, but also uh, a cricket manager uh, within the Proteas, right? And uh, we'll get his thoughts. And then, of course, we will get Cricket South Africa's uh, comments on what they've just heard and their own thoughts going forward. Later on, so I think for the better part of the first hour or so, it would be around these players and, and uh, official them. Uh, later on, we're going to welcome comments from you, um, but, but they won't be uh, audio comments. They will be in text form, which just, just makes it easier, uh, certainly from a technical point of view. So we welcome that. But also feel free to ask those questions even on, on social media to others and comment, again, that point, racism uh, in sports. So for those who's, um, you know, whose, whose chomies are trying to link in here, they can't sort of get in, uh, it's not just... Uh, a sign on in terms of the webinar, but if you go to the the Katana Foundation's Facebook page, it's, it's been currently broadcast live on Facebook as well, right? So, so that's what it is. Um, Busi has already muted every one of you besides the two of us at this point, so um, we can't um, so we can't hear you at the moment. Uh, and I mean, you could choose to to even uh, drop your your visuals for now if you're doing something that you don't really want us to catch on camera as well, unless it's time for you for you to. to as well. So 
With that in mind, I think here's the issue. I'm not going to repeat all the things that have been said before because it's going to come up in the discussions anyway. But here's the point. Amongst the three questions to ask, okay, is there a problem with racism in South African cricket? If the answer to that is yes, what is that problem? And the third question is, so what do we do about the problem of racism in cricket? I'm not preempting it. I don't know. I want to find out from people who know a lot more than I do, okay? And that really is, is the plan. So let me then introduce um, the, the panelists. Um, and we were debating whether we should do it in batting order. And I suggested maybe Robin Peterson, who is maybe the lower order all rounder, but he's done pretty well as a pinch hitter, Robbie. I haven't forgotten about that. So we're going to have Robin Peterson first up, right? Um, uh, coming up, I'd also tell you that uh, I mean, he's played, so the three players have all played for the, for the South African national team uh, Robin Peterson, JP Dumini, and Mondi Zondeki, of course, the, the, the bowlers. So maybe a warm welcome to, to the three of you first up, uh, and, and maybe a good thumbs up. Uh, that we appreciate your presence here. JP, Wandi, and, and uh, Robin Peterson, right. And then also we have Dr. Mohamed Musaji, who was the, as I said, the Black B player, uh, who then uh, managed the cricket team for a long time, but that ended, what, about a year ago, I think it was. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you for your time, uh, Dr. Mohamed uh, Musaji. A thumbs up would do, uh, right. And uh, now I want to check if we have, in fact, we do, we have the representative from um, Cricket South Africa, Dr. Eugenia Kula Ameo, who's the chairperson of the Transformation Committee uh, on the Cricket South Africa board. And, and a warm welcome to you as well. Thank you for, for your time. So that's the plan. That's, that's the panelists, okay? Uh, there are other people trying to get in, but we certainly can appreciate your comments. So let, let's get cracking. Um, and, and this is the plan. I'm going to go through the cricketers first, um, starting with Robin Peterson, to, to chat approximately five or seven minutes or so maximum uh, unchallenged. Say whatever it is you want to say, okay? We all have our opinions. I will then ask some questions, not a lot, based upon what you said, and then we'll move on to player B, player number two and player number three, and then Mohamed Musaji, and then finally from Cricket, uh, Cricket South Africa. So that's the plan. But with all of them, it will be five to seven minutes maximum. So may I suggest, right, that when you do so, uh, we can get sidetracked with other issues. If you can, as much as possible, stay, stay with, I think, ignore the solutions for the moment, okay? Because that will come up later on. So just ignore the future. Stay with my question. Is there a problem with, with racism in South African cricket? What is the problem? Tell us from your experience, not from somebody else's like a Hashi Mamla or a Makai and Tini or a Graham Smith or whatever else they may think. We want to know it from you because you've played the game. You've been a part of that particular journey, okay? And, and I'd ask you to stay with that theme. So, uh, Robbie Peterson, first up, you've got, uh, should I say what, your seven minutes or so starts now. Go ahead. Well, see, good evening, uh, Mr. Galda. Uh, I think it's uh, a privilege to be here in uh, the Katrada Foundation. Um, certainly, someone as young South Africans, we can all aspire to, um, you know, things that he's achieved and, and, and still carry on his legacy and the, and the dream he, he has for our country. So, um, it's a real honor to be here. I think you caught me off guard there a little bit. Uh, I was hoping this is going to be a little bit more interactive, but uh, is there a problem with racism? I mean, we first got to define what it is. Um, you know, um, um, is there an issue with, you get it, well, I think you could probably go down the, is it physical in terms of someone calling you a particular name that, you know, could be derogatory to you or your ethnicity? Or does it happen covertly where, you know, subtly where it chips away at your psych psychology over long periods of time. And I'd probably say it's more the latter. Um, you know, um, where either people are aware or unaware of their subconscious bias that they have, has been fed to us throughout our lives. And uh, we saw Michael Holding, uh, you know, uh, bring it to light in uh, many ways where he broke down, where... After so many years, he's kept it in, and, and, and basically the guys shed a tear. You know, it was the only time a platform he could, he could was allowed to express it was because of George Floyd. I mean, a lot of people call George Floyd uh, um, plenty things. He's a convict or whatever, but maybe he was a martyr. Maybe, he, you know, he needed to, you know, uh, we needed something, an intervention like that for the world to realize that, hey, we need to reset and 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 reflect and, and really think about how we think about each other on this planet because I don't think it was a healthy way. We look at uh, politics around the world 
whether it's sport, um, Black Lives Matter, maybe it's a little bit misunderstood in South Africa. It's been uh, taken on very positively in other parts of the world. And, um, you know, it's, it's just about equality. I think people need to understand it's about equality. It's about people that have been chipped away psychologically, not only physically for long periods of time, saying, hey, enough now. Okay, let's respect each other. Uh, we want to live together. And we want to appreciate each other's diversity. Um, and we want to do something special together. You know, um, we cannot do anything alone. We're all part of the human race. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's the one thing, um, you know, that, that's really stood out to me. So um, have I experienced it from a physical point of view, being called something derogatory? Yes, I, I have on a cricket field in South Africa um, a few years ago. By I'm, I'm not going to go put names out there by, by some cricketers that have uh, represented this country. So, yes, it has occurred. Um, but um, has it uh, occurred covertly my whole career? Uh, probably in, 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 in drips. You know, it gets drip fed all the time. So, um, you know, like I said, it's about people um, really reflecting and looking at their unconscious bias that they have. Um, why do they think of you in a particular manner, you know, um, instead of looking at you as an individual and, and, and appreciating you for that? Um, I'm not sure if uh, you want to ask me any questions. <laughs> right, well, well, I, well, I want to. Is there anything more you can tell us about your lived experience? So, so as opposed to, you know, macro issues like Black Lives Matter yeah. and, and Michael Holding, like, like you, you touched on, have you experienced... Um, uh, derogatory slants to you. Yeah, maybe tell us, tell us, I mean, can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, without getting into names. I mean, I have been called the K-word on a cricket field before. Um, that was years ago when I, when I just started. So, um, in a provincial game. So, you know, I, obviously we weren't confident enough back then because we were pretty much the first generation coming through. Um, if memory, uh, you know, if you can cast your mind back that far. So, yeah, there, was, there were uh, issues like that. We just didn't have the confidence to take it up with the authorities. You know, you were in the minority, so you felt that, you know, there was no way you could, um, you could, you could tackle it. Um, so, yeah, I did. And, you know, there, there are instances where people need to understand that we live in South Africa. You know, we live in a country where you play with black cricketers, with Muslim cricketers, with brown cricketers, with white cricketers, and you have to understand and respect each other. Um, have things happened uh, covertly? Yes, they have. You know, I've had coaches tell me that uh, we're not picking you for this series because um, we, you need to work on your batting or we believe that that guy's a better batter than you. Or, or we, you know, where I'm competing with a guy of similar skill. Where I know it's, it's not the real reason, you know. It's, uh, it's, it's just the way of saying we don't, we don't want you part of this. Team, you know? So uh, without making too many excuses about it, um, Yes, I have experienced it. And um, I mean, there have been instances with guys um, saying that a particular player in South Africa, that's, I mean, these are teammates saying that a particular player thinks like a, a white player, you know, um, actually physically told, and I, I was shocked that he thought it was comfortable, he was comfortable enough to tell me that, you know. Um, so oh, clearly, um, our relationship has never been the same, you know. Um, I respect him because we uh, play together, but uh, I think that's as far as we'll ever go again until we unpack probably why he thought that way. So have I experienced it? Yes. And I'm sure a lot of players would have uh, experienced it too, but uh, you know, we're on this platform to come up with solutions and, uh, and be part of the solution because I'm a very solution based person. And um, I think we need to uh, see how we can uh, make it better and, and create awareness around the situation. Okay, so so let, let me pick up then on a couple of things that you that you've said, right? Uh, I mean, here's, here's the key one: um, you, you, you never felt confident um, to, to tackle the issue. Right? Uh, perhaps just for the benefit of people watching, um, what what period have you played cricket? Like, what year did you start playing provincially? Then for the national team, so when did you start? When you stopped? A very very quick bio, so so we have a sense of of where you are with that? Yeah, I played in, uh, I started my career in 97. Uh, played, retired in 2016. So um, 19 years of first class cricket and then for the national side, 
2002 to uh, 2014, I played my last game. So, um, I've been around for a while. I was probably one of the first uh, players of color, if you if you want to call it that, um, to be you know, sort of planted in the system. You know, that's what it felt like back then. But uh, you know, I was clearly the best player in my position. I earned my the right to be there. So uh, you know, um, I was I've been around for a while, Mr. Garda, 19 years. <laughs> Well, there you are. So, I mean, here's the thing. I don't even think we need to go down a history lesson about whether the K-word is right and wrong. I mean, really, we'd be, we'd be, we'd be rather naive if we spend time discussing that. It's a given what the position is. It's a given what it says constitutionally and what it certainly meant when this country moved on to a, a democratic South Africa in 1994, right? Yet your point, as someone who's represented this country, right, not just provincially, but, but on the national stage, you're saying, you, you never had the confidence to tackle the type of slurs that you received. But that's not overt, that's not covert. Covert just sounds like a horrible name right now because of COVID-19, but, but that was overt, right? Then there were some other more covert things to say. And yet you never had the confidence. Why did you not have the confidence? Why would a person who's played for his country and therefore traveled abroad, had the privileges of acquired privileges that many others don't have, still did not have the confidence to tackle this issue today. Help us understand that. I think you, remember when I, when I started playing, there was only two players of color in the team, myself and Gondi Kruger. So, you're the minority. Um, everyone's uh, white on your team, you know. Um, who do you go to at the end of the day? You know, um, there's no one to go to. There's no managers or anything. All you do is discuss it amongst yourself. And, and that's as far as it will go. You know, um, there were no protocols in place where you could assist the player, whether it was uh, taking it up with the authorities or, or um, psychological um, interventions that could help you manage the process. So there was a, there, the, the system wasn't, uh, I'm not saying the system's a much, it's better equipped for those things. But at the time it was, Everything was still new. The system was immature. You know, we didn't um, have a lot of players of color around or not a lot were in your team, or definitely not teammates. So, you know, these were, these were issues, you know, that uh, we probably hang over from a part that, that still uh, lingered on in the system. Okay. And, and then that, that point about, uh, I mean, you said yourself at Garner Kruger, that I think it would be at provincial level, right? Playing in the Eastern Cape. But, but when you then played at, at a national level, um, not just in terms of players, players that were changing, but uh, the colours of the players were changing. But but the but, but the administration uh, certainly was not was not a white administration, both in terms of management um, and, and both are in terms of, of uh, elected officials of cricket. SA. Uh, at that stage, did you still not feel confident enough to to raise any issues, and, and why not? I think Mr. Gala is very is very. That's a difficult one to answer because as players. All you want to do is play the game. So, you know, sometimes, I mean, it's, it's human nature. We put it at the back of our mind. We just think about all these things that get sped to us in a, in a cricket team. You must be tough, resilient, the South African way. What do you do? You get tough and you put walls around yourself and you learn to deal with it and get on with the job because at the end of the day, you love playing the game. Do you want to be the guy that's the, the troublemaker or whatever it was tag term to be back? back then when I started, you probably just wanted to do well at the game and, and, and you know, try and represent South Africa. Um, mm. you all, and that's, there wasn't a space where we could uh, tackle it uh, maturely. You know, whether, you know, whether the system's mature enough to tackle it now, I think we, we're trying to put things in place where we can be. But um, back then, it was definitely not a space. You just thought that, you know, you're going to get on with it. I mean, the... I mean, if you look at the history of sports, there have been plenty of um, black players that have suffered the same um, discrimination. And, you know, they've sort of also tackled it in the same manner. Um, you know, so um, it was, I wasn't the only one that dealt with it in this fashion. There were plenty of us. You know, all you had to do is you focus, use it as fuel to make yourself a better player and to show that, listen, yeah, you're just not you're making up the numbers. You're actually going to play well and you're going to beat them. And that's how we use it. We use it to try to turn it into a positive. But over time, that chips away at you and your confidence and your psyche as a person. 
and you forget that you're still going to be a human being once you leave the game. And you're not sure how that carries on into your, into your personal life. And that could have spilled over into mine. I have no idea. You know, um, that's something I will probably need to reflect on um, a little bit more as an individual, whether that I've taken that on into my personal life. Mm. Now, I mean, you, you, you come to, your, to the end, certainly playing uh, professional cricket, uh, certainly in this country now, but the, with, with hindsight, so, so you, you, you never felt, I mean, you use the word space a few times, which I think is a very important point. I think Cricket SA needs to make a note of, right? Uh, we'll talk about them later on. But with, with hindsight, did, did you, you know, you said we just wanted to play cricket, right? Do, do you think that knowing certain things were wrong and you just wanted to, as you said, just play the game, right? That perhaps you, you were wrong as well. I'm just trying, and I'm not, I'm just trying to understand you, like that. Perhaps I should have done, and yet Michael Holding is also only doing it, uh, not even the tenor of his game, he's, he's like at the end of his broadcasting career, right? So like, do you think perhaps if people like yourself said a lot more earlier on, it, it would have changed even for the next generation? I think when you talk to the generation before me, that it, they'd probably say the same thing. We should have spoken up uh, then, you know? So I think on reflection, probably I could have, but would I have been around for a 19-year career, you know? That, that would have remained to be seen. Who knows? Maybe that my career would have been five years, six years. So let's be very clear that we were not in a space to speak up back then. You know, there was no psychological safety, people that protected you. You know, yes, the administrators were there, but were they equipped to deal with this situation? I'm not so sure they were, you know? So... Everything's evolving now. We're getting to a point now where we have to realize that some things were not right. Were we integrated too soon? Were, were people from both sides, were they educated about diversity? You know, there's still people today that probably play the game in our system that are not educated about the diverse country they live in and only playing their silos. And that's something that you need to address. I mean, I'm a coach now. That's something I've got to try and educate my players on that, we play in a beautiful country. Try to find your similarities as, as players. You know, you guys are a lot similar than you think. You know, and, and these are the things that we need to address. But in terms of psychological safety, I don't think there was psychological safety in the system for us to be able to air our grievances. It's a lot better now. I think yeah, safety numbers now a little bit. So, so players feel a lot more confident to tackle those issues. So it was a more of a psychological thing, I believe, than... Uh, than, um, than anything else. All right, and, and just, just the last thing, the last thing for now before, and we'll certainly come back and talk about the future uh, just now, right? Um, I, I take it, you know, you mentioned the, the, the cricketers who spoke to you or, or somebody used the K word and other things that were sort of slurring you at that time. Uh, and you said, okay, no name. So, so two things. One is that, do I take it that it's a provincial cricketer or cricketers? Uh, and you did say that, that person or persons uh, went on to represent the country. Have I, have I got that right? Did you also play with that person in the national team? It was a provincial game. It was a, a player that went on to play a lot of test matches for this country. Um, I didn't play with him in the national side, but he was actually my hero growing up. And, um, you know, someone I really respected until that moment in my life. So, um, you know, when you reverse, when you looked up to someone as a cricketer and you get to see them as a person, you know, the, you know it's, it's, a, it's a very sad thing to realize that, you know, this is more than cricket that's going on here at the moment. And um, okay. let me just say I was very disappointed in what I heard from that particular person. But, yeah, you went on to play a lot of cricket for this country. Okay, did you, did you, you said, I mean, you couldn't go to a safe space, and I think that's an important point, but did you, did you respond to that person, at least telling that person, hey, man, that's not on, that's not, that's not cricket, you know, that's out of line. Did you, did you at least just show your disappointment to that person directly? Not really. I didn't, um, you know, uh, I didn't really respond to it. I mean, well, how do you respond to that in that moment? I know I got 100 in that game. That was probably the best way to respond, if I'm completely honest. I use it as fuel to motivate the performance. And that's what I did. You know, um, 
you pissed. <laughs> Sorry, you made me angry. You motivated me. <laughs> I decided to uh, use it with, you know, the talent I was, uh, you know, given from above. Don't let your cricket do the talking. I'm going to let you go now for, for now, Robbie. Just one thing. You, you've chosen not to tell us who that person is, right? Um, wh why not? Wh let's say now. Now, understand sometimes societies change, right? Uh, but Michael Holding, a, a non-South African, says a lot of things. Makai Antini says things. Ashwell Prince says things. A whole lot of other different people. Uh, do you not think now it's the right time uh, to, let's call it hashtag me too, you know, like, hold it, I've been a victim of this type of racism uh, and I want to bring it up and say, that's the person, all these are the people, not even, I'm not talking of the, the, the subliminal race, I'm talking of the very blunt, direct, derogatory remarks targeted towards you. Why would you not bring it up? No, I don't think so. I think for me, for me personally, I just don't feel that it's necessary for myself to do it. Um, I don't really want to go back into that space. You know, for me, I, don't, I just feel, <laughs> to be honest, I feel pity for that person more than anything. So I don't really want to go back down that route. And I want to be part of solutions, Mr. Garda, to be completely honest with you. I want us to confront things, but I also want, don't want to go too far back in the past because that person's not involved with cricket, you know, in this country. So I don't believe that there's a space for him and I don't believe to give him any more airtime than he deserves. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for, for, for those invaluable insights. Some of it really, really said as well. And I, and I think that type of emotional aspect has got to be punctuated uh, when, when we look at going forward. Okay. I want to bring in Amandi Zondekin. Amandi, I appreciate your time. So again, you've got about a maximum seven minutes and then I'll ask you questions based upon. And again, I want to leave it to your personal story. What, what is your exp personal experience? <coughs> Cheers. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you for the people who organized this. And uh, thank you once again for having me um, to share my thoughts and my stories. Um, and like Robin, I, I didn't experience the direct uh, racism he speaks of, uh, the K word, for example. Um, there's the, but your original question, is there racism in cricket? Of course there is. I think um, cricket is a small bit of, of the country that we live in. And to think that you know, if there's no racist, if, if, if the country that we live in is a racist country with, uh, with, with racism still carrying on, um, then for sure that uh, I'm sure most companies, big companies especially, and a sport like cricket, with so many participants of different races, there's certainly going to be uh, racism in it. Um, and so I firmly believe that it's still there, certainly still exists, but I, I, I was never racially um, abused. Uh, by another player or coach. Um, I think most of mine uh, racism or um, discrimination came um, from selection, uh, which was a big part of what we've spoken about um, with other people. But yeah, mine was selection. Um, where it always seemed like because of the quota system that was put in place, it always seemed like it was like a backlash or a, a pushback um, for those who Obviously, we're, we're not in favor of a quota system. Um, I've seen it in media when they write uh, things about me. I mean, I remember I read a story uh, where I was still playing um, when a writer, a cricket writer, um, said that I know that I, shouldn't be, I should not be playing for South Africa and that, that I'm a quota player. Um, and the thing is, he said that I know that. Not that his opinion is that I'm not good enough, but the fact that he thinks that I know that. Um, and I'd never spoken to this person in my life before, but I saw a report that he had wrote, written. And uh, media is a very powerful tool in this country, or anywhere, actually. Uh, you can influence people just from uh, your pen in the paper by, by the things that you put out there. So, um, yeah, I mean, I could give you stories about selection where I thought that I was treated very unfairly a couple of times. And most of it came in the national team, um, where one communication between me and um, those in charge was not great and when things did happen that I didn't agree with, um, there was no feedback to me about why you weren't, you weren't picked for this tour or, um, or why you weren't selected there again, uh, or why you were dropped uh, from, from the team when it seems like other guys who don't look like me, uh, who are not people of color, get given a lot more opportunities to fail um, before they kick out of the team. Um, it always felt like you only had 
had one opportunity and if you didn't take it, uh, there was the end of you. Um, I, was, I was consistently told that um, I must wait till Makai retires before I take up the case of being the starting level. I mean, I was on tour, um, but it, it always sounded like you couldn't have two black Africans at the same time or both bowlers in the team. Um, so to hear that, you know, until Makai retires or if he's dropped or whatever, that's the only time you're going to play um, from the coaches was really disappointing. Um, and I remember one incident where I was told by a coach after playing for eight years professionally that only now he thinks that I'm good enough to play for South Africa. Uh, and this guy had been coached for two or three years. Um, so all this time that I was around or in the team, he never believed that I was good enough. Um, but stats, numbers, speed of my ball, whatever I was doing showed that I was. Um, and I had my own beliefs, obviously, that I thought I was good enough. Uh, so, yeah, my gripe is very much uh, a lot on selection and um, being called a quota player, uh, basically being told you're not good enough to play for South Africa, you're only there because of the color of your skin. Um, and those are the things that, you know, I experienced, I read, I heard from not other players, uh, certainly it felt like it from some coaches um, and, yeah, in, in the crowd, but those aren't people that are directly involved in cricket. Um, but no, I did not, as I said before, experience the direct racism um, as Robbie uh, had alluded to earlier. Okay, so anything else you want to add? I may ask you some questions. Anything else you want to say? Um, no, no, that, that's pretty much it. Yeah, yeah. we'll, we'll talk the future differently uh, just now. Yeah. Right? Okay, so yeah. let me get this right. You're saying I, I never experienced direct racism, but then you said uh, a coach told you that uh, you know, you'd have to wait for my client team to retire. Um, what would you call that? Did that coach suggest that, you know, for example, if, if, you, if you were the, the left arm bowler and they want to have only just one left arm bowler in the team, you need the one left arm or not to perform for you to get in. That I can understand. But, but did yeah. you link that to the fact that we have that one black player we need that black player to move out for you as the black player to come in or because you're a fast bowler? I, I think part of it was because I'm a fast bowler. Um, and it, it, it again, when you say direct racism, um, I've never really been able to define it by, by words of someone else besides using the most obvious words to you. Um, but people can certainly discriminate against you because of the color of your skin. Now, is that racism as well? Um, I'm not quite sure, but I think, yeah, it does. But obviously, if I was a white player, that conversation wouldn't have happened. So it is because of race that I, I felt like I was, I was spoken to in that manner. Um, it is because of race, again, that I felt that I wasn't given as many opportunities as others who were moved from opening batting, failed there, then moved to the middle order, failed there, and then only after that did they uh, get taken out of the team, where other guys seem like you get one or two chances, and if you don't use them, um, you are the team. And usually that happened to the players of color um, from my experiences and what I'd seen. Uh, and it happened to me too. Um, I went on a tour where I had a really good tour uh, the one year and I was in the squad. I played the last four test matches and the next tour I wasn't even in the squad and uh, I didn't get any answers. I wasn't told why. I was just left out and I had to go back to play provincial cricket again to, uh, to see what, uh, to try and get back into the team. So those are the things I, I, I talk about when I say, yeah, if I was a, a person of another race or color, would that have happened? Uh, but it seems like it was consistent with people of color, that kind of behavior, that is. And, and when you were told that you'd have to wait for Makai and Kini to retire uh, before you, you have a chance, did you, how did you respond? Not, not well, privately to yourself, you, know, you had a conversation with your own mind, but, but what did you tell that coach who told you that? Yeah, you know, I was still pretty young at the time. I was in my mid-20s. Um, and I think as what Robbie said earlier, I touched on that because it's very difficult. It was, at least then, um, to push back and be honest and say, well, I, first of all, disagree with that. And um, I think that that's the discrimination. I didn't say anything to him. My point of letting my frustrations out was telling uh, a family member or a friend of mine on the phone um, or some of my teammates that I could trust with that sort of information. Uh, so I, I never spoke out against it. 
or I never said I think that's wrong. Um, I accepted it and uh, I moved on. Uh, in hindsight, you wish he would have said something. Uh, perhaps his attitude or the way he talks to you could have changed. But at the same time, um, there, there wasn't a feeling like I had enough power for me to say something and then change his mind or, or anything different was going to happen. In fact, sometimes you almost think that if you push back against uh, selectors or coaches, then it almost has the other effect where they don't want to play you anymore and never pick you again. Um, so those are some of our fears uh, at the time when you are sort of discriminated against or feel like it's... It's interesting it's, it's you say you, you never felt you had the power, right? Yet, you know, when you play the game uh, as a batsman or a bowler, you, you're being asked to represent your country and feel all powerful and, and be incredibly self-motivated and team motivated to perform uh, on the best of your ability. I mean, it's almost like a disconnect, right? Uh, why did you feel... So here's like a ridiculous question to you, but it, it's, it needs to be asked. Like, why do you feel you didn't have the power in playing for a, an organization, Cricket SA and, and its, and its uh, provinces, um, that is democratically elected in a democratically elected uh, country, you know, we're a democratic country with a constitution that is absolutely non-racist, that is turned completely away from its apartheid past, and yet you feel you didn't have the power. What, why did you feel that? Well, one, I, I was a fringe player. Um, I was not the guy you couldn't drop in your team. Um, so it would be, it, it would have almost felt like it would have been easy for them to replace me if they thought my attitude was wrong, or if um, I'm speaking up or I'm speaking against the coach. Um, and the thing is, I had experience, not me personally, but I know stories about guys in the past who had gone to um, the CEO, for example, and they complained about their treatment within the national team. And the CEO did nothing. So they went to the media. And as soon as they went to the media, they got suspended for speaking out of term or bringing the game into disrepute or whatever they called it. So guys got punished for speaking the truth about how they got treated, even when they went to the highest form of power within cricket. So how do I now Dale Stane or whatever, um, where I felt like you know, there's nothing they can do. Uh, they can't drop me. I'm in the greatest form of my life. I was a reserve. I was uh, carrying drinks at the time. Uh, so yeah, I never felt like I had enough power to, to be able to go uh, to anybody that was going to stand up for me at the time. And, and uh, did you approach your, your CEO of Cricket SA directly as well with, with your complaints? I, I think it not, right? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. And, and then part of it was because I, I see what happened to others before me. I never thought anything was going to change for me if, if I do. So, you know, it's one of those things. Okay. The, um, the coach that, that uh, I'll move on now. The, the coach that told you wait for Makai and Tini um, to, to retire before, before you get your return, right? Um, I just want to make this very clear because there are people... Who are, who are probably going to tweet about this uh, and, and, and get it right, so hashtag racism in sports, right? W were you very clear in your mind that that comment was, was based on, on race? Or was, and I, I, I probably asked it again, but I want to just get it clear. Are you clear that it was based on race or was it a cricketing comment? So you're a wicket keeper, you have to wait for this wicket keeper to retire because he's just so great. W what do you think, then and now? Uh, I thought then, uh, it was certainly based on race. Um, why would I have to replace the other black guy in the team for me to make the team? There's three or four other fast bowlers in the team, and if they are a form and they're not, they're not performing, um, why cannot, can I not take one of their places? Why does it have to be a direct swap between another black African with another one? Um, so certainly, yeah, I thought it was based on race, uh, not because so, of my so position. The, logical, but the cricketing answer would be, look, there are four fast bowlers or you know, four seam bowlers, you, yeah. you're, you're the fifth the best. You need to be, you need to right. be in the top the next guy in the answer, right? Right. Would, yeah. you like so that, to, would you like to tell us um, the name of that coach? No, nah, I'm honestly, I'm not really that comfortable doing that right now. Um, I would just rather keep it in house instead of, you know, putting people's names in the dirt. Okay, fine. Uh, that, that last part about, about being a quota player, who's called yeah. you a quota player? Is it is it the media? Is it 
Is it supporters? Is it cricket South Africa officials? Uh, or, or is it players? No. Or is it all of them? No, uh, as I said before, um, certainly in the media, um, as I said, when I first read it, in fact, I actually read it um, again this year, and the person who wrote it had passed away, I can't even remember his name. Um, and then certainly from the crowd, uh, never came from players, because I think players know when another guy is really good or he's talented enough for how good the person is. And that goes for, because um, you play against players and they know. So I never, as I said, never experienced direct racism or being called a quota player by another player. It, it certainly came from guys who were on the outside, um, whether they were the media or okay. just a regular fan. So, I, I yeah. For a player, you know, the quota, which, 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 which is spelled with a Q, is, is like the new K word, right, for, for sports people. Um, right. How, how did you feel about being labeled then a, a quota player? I mean, just, just very quickly, tell us on the, on the emotional and psychological impact it had on you. I, I, to be honest, because it was people that I didn't really know, um, it never really had any effect on in terms of um, me taking it personally. I just took it as people that are ignorant, uh, they don't know any better, they don't know me, because um, I knew that I was good enough and I was, I was more than good enough to play for my country and, and to play provincial cricket in this country. So um, I, never, I never took it to heart. It didn't... Um, it didn't really affect me that much, but I knew that because, as I said, media is so powerful, um, you can change people's minds and make people think a certain way just because of how you write about someone. And that could spread and become something. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it didn't really affect me personally, but it's still something that you remember um, and, and you hold, and you hold uh, for, for the rest of your life, I guess. Okay, well, let's leave it at that, Monday. Appreciate your time and your honesty, just as, as Robbie Peterson has been. And I think, I mean, that's the point as we move forward just now. I think these, these, these narratives, these, these testimonies uh, are really important if we want to truly move on uh, from, from some of the hurt of the past uh, to, to the future. Uh, I'm going to bring in then JP, uh, JP Dumini now. Uh, JP, appreciate your time. So, again, you know, all the drill, you've got, you've got a maximum of about seven minutes. Uh, to pick up on what you want to say, and then I'll ask some questions. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Gardner. Uh, I think the, the starting point for me would be to acknowledge that, uh, you know, my, my first class debut, which was in 2001, uh, I, I certainly recognized at the time that the main reason that I got selected was not necessarily based on performance. Uh, I was a youngster. I was 17 years old. I was a prospect. I had the ability, and I was seen as a, as a, I guess, a talented cricketer that had a lot of potential. Um, and then I got given an opportunity. But for me, what I'm saying here, it, it not, I'm not saying it from a point of view that, uh, in a negative sense. What I'm saying is that that was where my opportunity arose. So I must, I must kind of share my personality. So my personality is one where. I, I'm, I'm a type of character that likes to see the glass off full. I give the benefit of the doubt to anybody. I trust easily. I, uh, you know, if somebody really needs to hurt me emotionally and physically for me not to, to trust that person. And, and the reason why I'm, I'm sharing that personality is because I want to say that I, I don't necessarily count myself uh, as a victim in, in, in the cricketing structures. Um, I, I, I certainly recognize the fact that I, I got an opportunity based on the color of my skin. But for me and my personality, I just saw it as an opportunity and I'm going to try and make the most of it. And fortunately for me, it, it kick-started pretty early uh, from, a, from a young age in first class cricket. And lo and behold, three years later, I was, I was representing South Africa at age 20. I mean, that in itself was, was a great uh, achievement, I guess, in my career. My family was pretty ecstatic about it. I was ecstatic about it. I think the, the holistic experience on that tour was quite eye-opening. And, and to see how fragmented our, our team at the time was, just in terms of the pockets, you know, the groupings within the team uh, was, was quite eye-opening. And I think, you know, Robbie, Robbie might have been on that tour as well. So you needed to find your comfort 
you needed to find a place where you knew that you could speak freely and that you could learn from the guys. But again, coming back to my personality, my personality was one that I was going to be bold enough to have conversations and, and engage with people irrespective of your, of your race. Uh, I, I guess I was very fortunate in my upbringing that I never really experienced a part day. Uh, my, my, my family probably shielded me from those experiences a lot. And so for me, I, I came in with, with quite, ex with quite a, I guess, an excited um, personality, one that wanting to engage and so forth. Look, the tour itself didn't go well. For the team, for myself, I got left out for, for a long period of time after that, and I needed to find the love for the game. So that's just the context of, of my, I guess, the starting point of my career. And going, going forward, I, I've, reflecting back on my career, having played 326 games across all formats, I, I certainly got many opportunities. And, and I think people saw a lot of ability in me and talent in me. Some would question whether I fulfilled that talent, fulfilled that ability, particularly in test cricket, Probably not. I came up short. You know, the numbers speak for itself. In white ball cricket, yes. I mean, the numbers are there. But I, I've, you know, just come back to your point on, on whether racism is, is in, in sport, in cricket. Without a doubt, I, I think if you listen to so many guys' stories, particularly guys that have stood up over the last couple of weeks uh, in, in defense of Lungi and, and, and that situation, how that unfolded, it certainly speaks volumes for what is still happening in our game, what is still happening in our country. I guess I've just been one of the fortunate ones uh, that hasn't necessarily been affected heavily by it. Uh, and I think the big part of why possibly that happened is based on my personality that a lot of it was almost naively done in that if something happened to me, I probably didn't even realize it or pick it up. And, uh, and in, in that, I've, I've obviously experienced a long career, but I've certainly seen things happen. I've certainly seen things unfold in front of my eyes, not necessarily to me. And, and I guess the, 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 the part that I, that I really want to acknowledge and take responsibility for is why did I not speak up in those moments? And I think that's an important reflection for myself. Uh, and I think for all of us as, as players of color, if... I mean, I think we've, we've certainly heard from Robin and Monday as well that we were reluctant to speak up. So even though it didn't happen to me, I was still reluctant to speak up. And I think the main, one of the main reasons that comes up for me in reflection is that I probably had that up of the green there. And I was in a fortunate position. So I need to take responsibility for the fact that I didn't speak up. And, and the reflection is because I was benefiting. I was benefiting at the time, and that's a hard reflection. Um, but it, but it is a it is a true reflection at at, at this point in time. Okay, uh, JB, a couple of things. I, th I think you've been very very honest about your position because I mean that's the reality. Somebody asked me the question about the the Mackay and Keeney, uh, bus story and said, well, why did he speak up before? And one can also reflect and say, well, maybe he. He played enough games to have the rubber between. I'm not saying that's true, but you know, that's so I think you've been very open about that. Actually, you were fine, right? But but you said, however, that you didn't see yourself as a victim of racism directly, but you certainly saw it, right? Can you share some of the things you saw? Yeah, I think it stems a little bit of, uh, in terms of what Mondi was referring to in terms of selection. Um, maybe certain players. Uh, you, you kind of looked at, at that selection policy or even the reasoning why they weren't playing. Uh, and, and this is not only upon reflection. It's, you know, you kind of having a reflective view of your career uh, once you've kind of stepped down and, and, and these kind of things come up in terms of a conversation and you, you question yourself. I mean, what has happened in your career, uh, one to yourself and one to other people, um, can you question that? And 100%. Uh, and, and, and it stems a lot from, from selection. Um, I've certainly been uh, on the field, might have experienced certain things that Robbie felt there in terms of emotionally and mentally uh, being victimized. 
Uh, I've certainly been maybe on the field itself where that has happened to somebody else. Uh, and in def- I didn't stand up for that. So again, that is a, a self-reflection. Why didn't you? Why didn't you stand up for that person? So, okay, uh, I think what, what what happened? You were on the field, and it happened to a colleague, right? And yes, you've been yeah. honest, but you didn't stand up. Can you tell us the story of, of what what did happen? Yeah, it's it's based upon how how people have spoken to. Um, I remember. I, I won't mention the person who, who was speaking towards the player. I remember batting with with Ashville Prince um, in, a, in, a, in a provincial game and there were some harsh words said to him um, and yeah, he, look, he was the type of character pretty much like Robbie as he said there. Um, that was kind of the fuel that, uh, that fueled them in terms of uh, showing them who they are and what they're about. So as we know, uh, Ashville is a type of character that is going to use that to show them through his performance. And he certainly did that on numerous occasions and, and particularly that time itself. And what, what was said to him? Can you, can you remember? The cable came up. Yep. I was saying, what, what was said to, to Ashville? I said the, the keyword came up. Okay. Yeah, and that, and that was by an opposition player in a provincial team, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, you you said that you know should I have said more? Uh, you know, without a doubt. Uh, is there more you, you you want to say now publicly? I mean, in fact, this is a public platform because it's it's broadcast mm-hmm. publicly. But is there anything more that you wish to say, not about yourself because it hasn't happened to you, but about about others? Um, around the issue of racism in cricket? Yeah, I think the thing that has really come up for me in the last couple of weeks is we certainly as a country need to acknowledge each, each person's story. And I think that's exactly what we're doing here. We, we're giving an opportunity and a platform for guys to share their experiences. And, um, you know, can they heal from those experiences? And, and I think... The, the, yes, I've, I've been in a beneficial position where I haven't necessarily felt it, um, but I certainly empathize with it. I certainly want to hear people's stories yeah. and, and walk I the journey with finished. people and say, sorry, who's that? Yeah, okay. so I, I to, just, just, just make sure, Abusi, everybody else is muted, please. Yeah, carry on. Yeah, I certainly want to be part of the solution, as Rabi has uh, pointed out as well. And... Yeah, and give people a platform to speak and, and empathize with people. Can we sit with somebody and just acknowledge them without any judgment, without any buts? Um, and I think that's, that's the space that we need to get to as a cricketing fraternity, as a nation, you know. Um, can we get to that space and, and sit around a table and have conversations and allow each person to share in their experiences? Now, here, here's the difference for me is that there will be plenty of cricketers in, in a privileged position, let's call it white, that would not have been in a position where they've victimized somebody or called them anything. And I think the, 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 the thing that has come up in, in, in people's experiences is it is not necessarily to apologize for that as a white race. I think the important thing here is to acknowledge it. And I think that is what players of color, black African, are crying out for is they, they're crying out for an acknowledgement that there have been uh, stories of injustices, of victimization. And can you listen to our stories and not point fingers at us and say, but you did this, but you did that, but you did that. Just listen to my story and empathize with my story. And that is my cry for, for us as a cricketing system. Yeah, I think it's a very important point. Just like I have a story to tell, I've been hurt. And I want to tell you, just the last thing for, for now, then you, I just want to get Gary to, you made the point about getting into, I think it was the national team. I just want to get my, my facts right. And you said, uh, you know, your, the team was very fragmented. Um, just, just help us clarify, that was a team on tour to where, what year was that? And when you talk about being fragmented, uh, was it fragmented on racial lines? I mean, just, just share that with us, please. So, so. This was a 2004 tour Sri Lanka. That was my debut tour. So the reason why I say that is I, I don't think, or I am actually pretty sure, that we, are, we had no idea what it meant to play to South Africa. And what I mean by that is, what does it mean to come together and represent something bigger than yourself? 
So what we do as, as, as natural, as from a cultural point of view, we gravitate to what is comfortable. So whites will gravitate towards whites, colors will gravitate towards colors, blacks will gravitate towards black, because that's a natural thing for us. So yes, there might be an intentional thing from certain guys when it comes to that. I, I, I don't know that experience. But what I'm saying is that was my experience in that there was fragmentation around the cultural groups. And me being naive in that space was, yes, find my comfort, but I want to I wanna explore. I want to go out and say, listen, can I come out with you for dinner? What, what are you guys doing? Those are the kind of experiences. Um, so that, what, that is what I mean by, by fragment, is that the cultural differences were there. And only later on, and I think Mondi and, and, and Robbie were part of that, only later on was it maybe six years later, 20, 2008 to 2010, was, was that a process where we really took, took cognizance of the fact that we needed to understand what it meant to play for South Africa. And interestingly, the, the culture camp that we had, Amit Katrada was actually there to share in, in the experiences um, in apartheid years and what it meant and what, what he went through. So those were the kind of stories, whether you were black, white, colored, Indian, whatever you may be, those are the color, kind of stories that we got to hear. And we, so that we could understand what, where we came from, what was our past. And at that point in time, we were trying to heal. But as we see now in 2020, we still probably haven't healed properly from the past. And, those are that, and that is the main reason why we're sitting here today having these conversations. And I'm extremely excited by the fact that we're having these conversations. Because this is the starting point of the healing process, is acknowledging what the problem is. Yes, we need to find solutions, and those are going to be the follow-up conversations. But we first need to acknowledge where we've been. We first need to acknowledge the people that have hurt. And I think we've, we've oppressed and suppressed the fact that, we, okay, you've experienced that, but I don't want to hear about it. Let's just move on. We can't move on until we've actually acknowledged the people that have hurt. And, and that's the space where I'm in, as I said, is that I, I've not necessarily felt it, but I want to hear those people's stories and I want to empathize with those people because those people are important in our country. Absolutely. And just, just the last thing then, when you speak about fragmentation on, on sort of cultural lines um, that that would I take it socializing did that did that also happen in, in the you know in the training sessions and on the field of play no I, I think that was probably the one place that, that came naturally to guys to probably interact a little bit better um, that was certainly my experience and, and maybe because the, the, the big thing about that, you kind of forced to do that because you need to engage to, to play together. You can't play this game by yourself. And yes, you can be prob probably selfish at certain times in the game, but you need your teammates for, it, for the team to be successful. Um, so there certainly was engagement, um, but from a cultural point of view, outside of, sorry, outside of the game, um, we certainly were segregated. Okay, got that. I appreciate your, your thoughts for now, JP. We'll, we'll certainly talk about the future in a moment. I want to bring in then uh, Dr. Mohamed Musaji, so uh, former team manager uh, of, uh, of the Pro Cheers and has been with them for a while. Uh, Mohamed, thanks for your time. And uh, you know the drill, uh, five, seven minutes of yourself and then I'll ask you some questions. Go ahead. Boost if you can just unmute yourself. Go ahead, thank you. Thank you, Asha. Thanks for having me. Uh, I think at the outset, I'm not surprised that it has all come to this. I am surprised that it's taken so long. And I think we must understand that although South Africa has been transformed from what was called like a racist authoritarian re regime to a democracy, those deep physical and psychological scars have remained. We must understand that prejudice is very much, much part and parcel of our country's DNA. And it remains in certain sections of our society until today. We couldn't just wish away this uh, process of healing once democracy arrived. And I think the starting point is that we needed a proper TRC process, which did not happen in cricket. And because it did not take place in cricket, there was no trust, there was no healing, and there was no confidence to build a great uh, cricketing society and community. So coming now to the point you're asking about our lived experiences. Interestingly enough, in 1992, I was there when Unity took place initially. I was part of the initial provincial team that 
practiced for Transvaal and we'd come to what, the Wanderer Stadium for training. We'd rock up there at four o'clock, training would finish at six o'clock. And in those days, when the lights were down, the players were going down, the players of color had to pad up and go in that. So we experienced a lot of it in those days. When it came to players of color, undoubtedly in the national team, there's no doubt they had to work much harder than their white counterparts. And this is often due to what we call inherent bias, whether you want to call it conscious, unconscious, or learned, or you want to say it was due to patent racial uh, tendencies. From my point of view, in 2003, when I was appointed uh, the doctor of the team, interestingly enough, you find that there were squad members that were uncomfortable with the fact that there was a so-called non-white doctor that they had to deal with. In fact, it was quite funny because initially it didn't bother, bother me at all. Uh, the barriers they had to get used to, uh, they needed to, to get used to a person of color being around. And funny enough, they had no choice but to develop that trust. And then when it came to being team manager in the early days of Cricket South Africa, I'm talking of my appointment in 2008. When you talk about prejudice or unconscious bias, it did not only happen in South Africa, it happened when we toured overseas as well. So you travel specifically when you go to England and to Australia. I think they could not comprehend the fact that you had a person of color that was leading or managing mostly white players. And there were times where administrators or officials from the opposing countries would try and bypass me and have communications directly with the coach. So it was, it was really an interesting scenario, uh, you know, the journey that we, we, we went through as a, with the South African team. And I think from a coach's perspective, I mean, JP has been kind with some of his words because I remember his first tour in 2004. It was very painful. He was a youngster that came into the team uh, as a batsman and some matches he batted at, at nine and I was still the doctor of the team and we had these conversations on the bus. And I think he was ready to give up the game on one of those tours. Uh, but I'm glad that he stayed and he's been an absolute legend for South Africa. I think from a coach's perspective, uh, we, we recognized that we needed to address this differences in culture. And we had this, the first team culture camp, which was round about in 2010. And the objective was twofold. Number one, we wanted to develop an authentic and emotional sense of identity. But what we took into account is that we wanted to consider our fractured past. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we looked at our unique history. We looked at our diversity. And what this did was it provided some impetus initially, because it doesn't happen overnight. It provided some impetus to allow the team to talk about race, to talk about class, to talk about culture. But at the same time, it allowed this team culture to go onto the journey that we're talking about. And remember, team culture doesn't, doesn't develop overnight. What it needs, it needs, it needs commitment. It needs leadership. And then most of all, it needs a, a, a continuous amount of reinforcement. We're fortunate initially, the CEOs like Gerald Majola and Harun were instrumental in the team spending a certain amount of budget for these culture camps. But we must understand that if we consider the rich history and legacy of excellence and of black cricket specifically, it's largely been ignored in the media, especially the, the mainstream media. And this has allowed for inherent bias to develop and many uninformed uh, people to, to flourish with their ideas. Affirmative action was then taken to promote uh, as a solution to allow for integration. And the question then we need to ask ourselves is, has the policies of Cricket South Africa benefited us or in the long term has it caused regression? So this I specifically talk now about quotas, targets, and affirmative action. There's no doubt that it's become a numbers game. There's no doubt it's become almost like an exercise. While the real issue is at grassroots, and there still hasn't been enough to address it. And also, we need to look at the quality of opportunity for players of color. We need to look at that. There is no doubt that on the one hand, so the question is going to ask, has the quota system helped or hindered progress of players of color. And I can tell you on the one hand, there is absolutely no doubt that the quota system gave opportunities to players of color who proved their world-class performances. And I can name plenty, Makaya, Hashim, Ashwell, uh, Vernon. Okay, I mustn't forget our three guys on the panel tonight because they think I'm disrespectful. So Robbie, JP, Mondi. So while these guys were good enough, if it was not for the transformation imperatives, we may not have seen them. If it were not for affirmative action, many of these players would not have been given the opportunities or selected because of some people's inherent bias. But 
we also un have to understand that these same transformation imperatives has created a few challenges as well. So if you look at the flip side of the coin, it's created a comfort zone for some individuals who became complacent because it was a numbers game. And because of that, some guys were undroppable. So even if they didn't pass their fitness standards or, or meet fitness targets, they could not be left out of the squad. Even if they were disciplinary misdemeanors, they would never be left out of the squad. So I think as administrators, when I talk about administrators, I'm talking now specifically as senior management within Cricket South Africa, as well as the board members. The one important thing is that, as far as I'm concerned, is that too few have really, really served for the game, the community, and the country. I think it's important to remember that during the struggle, there were a number of people of, across all black communities specifically that contributed to the fight against apartheid. Unfortunately, we find that there's really some selfish administrators who are attempting to now create divisions within the own, amongst the black community. It's a super colored Indian and Asians. And as long as we continue on this path, all I can say is that we will remain disunited and we're not going to tackle this issue around unconscious bias, racism, or transformation. We're not going to tackle it head on. We also need to move away from this notion that we need to be black African to serve this transformation. We need to appreciate that people from across all the communities, including white people, have had, who, have, who have got their hearts in the right place, can contribute to transforming our society. I think the last point I want to make, uh, just for the initial discussion, is that I think the real task right now is to get people to behave into what we call a new wave of thinking rather than to think themselves into new way, to a new way of behaving. We cannot continue to play lip service to transformation 26 years into a democracy. I think time has come where we need tangible action. I think we're looking for real behavioral change. I can talk the whole day, Ashraf, but I think we, we, we're okay. struggling for time. And I'm so sure you want to so you, you've almost said some, some macro things and then looked at something for the future as well. But, but I want to just stay with the lived experience again. So you as the, the team doctor uh, of, of the national team, right? And, and you know, we're focusing on the national team for now because these players played for the national team. Um, and then you as the team manager for a long, long period, I think Gulam Raja before that, but I mean, you've been involved for a long time and very much in the glue between uh, cricket uh, administrators on the one hand and then the players themselves, right? So did you, a personally experienced racism, notwithstanding what you said earlier on about when people from abroad thinking of you differently, so maybe just pop that one aside. Did you experience racism from your fellow players, overt and sub subvert form of racism? And did you see racism within your team structures? Could you see that, that there were players being outwardly racist or uh, outwardly so, and then others were being denied opportunities are we only talking the national team now? Did, did you see that at all? I think we've got to understand that, that this has been a journey in the sense that I got involved with the national team in 2003 as the team doctor. And I said it up front. I mean, there were issues around unconscious bias. There was there. It was, it was for, for everyone to see. And later on, as we moved into the space of team manager 2010, what had happened is that as a team, we went on to a journey together because we needed to understand about each other. So. When people talk about unconscious bias, I, I use the example of someone like, like, like a Hashim, for example, because remember, if you look at un unconscious bias, on the outset, it talks about things that are automatic, they're unintentional, and they're deeply ingrained. So when Hashim came into the national team, I was still the team doctor, but I could remember it was difficult because people could not accept him. His beard was an issue, he didn't want to wear an alcohol a logo, he was a devout you know, Muslim who prayed five times a day. It was uncomfortable. The, the environment wasn't ready for that. And it was those kind of things that ensure that we needed to understand a lot more of each other. And I think if you listen to the three gentlemen that spoke earlier, especially with JP, Mondi, and what uh, Robbie P had to say, that there's a time early in their career where you actually felt very, very alone. But probably post-2010, some of that had changed. If you look at it, you, you reach the stage where selection or even the coaches or even the manager from 2012 onwards were people of color. And I've never said that 
I've never seen unconscious bias, but I'm not going to say that I've, I've seen someone uh, overtly racist to me. Now, I'll, I'll actually be dishonest by saying that. Okay, and, and what about overtly racist to, to players? So players be players within the same team structure? Not in my time, not in my time. Okay, uh, I, I, I want to ask you this then, you know, the, because it, but it's such an important one, the, in, in the comments um, that's come through from, from players that you, you, you may have managed, because maybe, maybe Pat Simcox, no, I'm trying to get my, my dates right, but, you know, Pat Simcox, Peter Dippenar, uh, a couple of other players um, who, who said certain things around the broader issue of, of Black Lives Matter, but it then became a cricket issue. Uh, and, and you got to know their, their thoughts. But what did you feel about that when you, when you heard them say what they said? Yeah, I think initially, I, I don't think many of them understand what this whole Black Lives Matter movement is all about. Uh, and it's, it's obvious by some of their reactions. So at the outset, I mean, we've got to understand it, 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 it speaks against racism. It speaks about systemic injustices against the black community. And it works basically for equality, for what we call for everyone, okay? So the Black Lives Matter slogan is not that Black Lives Matter more, but it's more that Black Lives Matter as much. And I don't think Pat Samo as well as Bhutan understood that. And I think we need to applaud somebody like Lungi Ngidi. Here's a youngster who's a quality champion human being, and he has shown awareness and he's shown maturity beyond his years. The fact that so many players of color are speaking out at the moment must concern Cricket South Africa and the country at large. Because these players of color have, and I think they continue to feel unsupported. We need to ask our questions, why? And all of us collectively need to ask the question, why? Because we need to listen to the answers. And I think when you look at the solutions, the most important stakeholder in all of this are the players themselves. Cricket South Africa as a board has to ask themselves one question. Why is it that just a few months ago, they were in court battle with the most important stakeholder and that's the players? We've tried to have this top-down approach, which hasn't worked for 26 years. Things need to change. These are the future, the few three gentlemen that you're seeing here. They're the future. They need to be sitting with the administrators. They need to be sitting with whoever's running the transformation in Davos going forward. Or the TRC, because I think we need a TRC. They need to sit with okay. them and say, yeah. listen, this is how we want things to go. All right. I certainly want to hear what, what the, the, the CSA representative will say about that in just a moment. You know, so, so here are the two things, overt racism uh, and, and covert racism. And you've said, you know, you, you haven't personally seen much of that yourself, right? Um, just the, the second last thing before I let you go, right? Okay, that's correct, but not in the national team. No, I'm, I'm talking about the national team, because yeah. I mean, that, that's a specific zone that you were involved in, right? Um, did you ever, so, so within the national team structures, did you ever find there was a need to speak up? about some form of racism that you held back, like, like J.P. Dumini said, and, and you know, Mondi said the same thing, and Robbie Peter said, did you ever feel that this is an injustice, and it's an injustice based on race or ethnicity, and it's wrong, but let me not say anything. Did that, did that happen? I think, I think the one thing that, that I did do uh, with a number of, I would say, team coaches or team uh, selectors or conveners, he challenged them on the quiet when it came to matters of unfairness or unconscious bias or when it came to select. Remember, I was never selected, right? But at the same time, initially, my duty was to look after the transformation imperatives of the team. And that's why sometimes, as Cricket South Africa, we need to be honest with the public. And if we had a, a policy to say that there's four players of color, like in the 2015 World Cup, 2015 World Cup, where the big issue became about Vernon or Kyle, Cricket South Africa need to stand up and say that's the unofficial police policy that you need four players of color and you can only deviate from that if there's a medical reason otherwise. And unfortunately, by not standing up, you're leaving a lot of things to interpretation. So to answer your question is that on many occasions I stood up, whether it was with the coaches, whether I thought it was sometimes a player saying things which was disrespectful. I mean, we would go to India and sometimes somebody would use the word Chili pips, you know, not realizing what they're saying in the early days. 
and they needed to be educated. We were in Bangladesh and there was a time when you're in a predominantly Muslim country and somebody is giving what we call the call to prayer and some of the players are saying, but why is he screaming? And again, it's about education. It's about having the conversation. So you don't call that racist. What you call and what you say is people also need to be educated about other people's culture and religious beliefs. And that's what the South African cricket team tried to do from 2010 onwards in what JP referred to, alluded, alluded to, with the culture camp. Because let's, let's be honest about one thing. If you look about culture, culture together with its historical back background is probably the most underestimated and misunderstood and mismanaged part of any organizational system. Yet in the context of cricket or in team sports, it's one of the most powerful mm -hmm. success factors. Mm -hmm. Or it could be our causes of failure. Mm -hmm. And our vision in 2010, when we embarked on that, we wanted to be the most diverse team in the country, also the most diverse team in the world. And we wanted to take that and use it as a competitive advantage. So it's no surprise that in 2010 or 2012, the protest team, partially transformed or not, happened to be the first team ever to reach number one status across all the formats of cricket. It's no surprise because the diversity was there, the buy-in was there. But it's about nurturing and fostering and feeding that all the time. Okay. But the last thing for now, uh, you know, yeah, we, we can debate issues of racism, overt, covert, subliminal, the entire night, right? And there's a whole issue about inherited cultural superiority that people feel, right? Um, however, of, of all the things that, that really struck me in the last couple of weeks, I think the, the comments by Makaya and team really got to me. Help us understand that, you know, saying something like, I felt so alone. Now, this is a, uh, a, 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 to me, certainly an extrovert. It came across as an extrovert, right? An effervescent personality. Help me understand how this, this effervescent personality, this extrovert can say, I felt so lonely that I would not travel in the team bus. Um, and I had to, I run, ran to the stadiums all the time. I mean, help us understand that. I mean, I think it's, it's surprising to every one of us, including me, in a sense that it's important to understand where Mac is coming from and what he's been through. I mean, he's been an absolute legend playing for South Africa, and his face will be as a beacon for every youngster that wants to represent South Africa. But at the same time, I probably, Mackie was in the team with me probably the last 18 months of his career. And I certainly never noticed him sitting all alone in the bus. There were many times that people or players themselves would run from the ground to the stadium, whether it was after training or after a match, it was part of doing the numbers, a part of the fitness uh, regime. Uh, but I've never seen him in that period, or he never ever came up to me to mention it as well. There were times where certainly for, when we were going out for supper, people would stick to their own because of cultural language, whether it was halal food, whether it was alcohol, whatever it may be. But there were times where people would consciously allow themselves to join another group. I didn't see that happening, especially post-2010. Prior to 2010, maybe that was very, very difficult because, because of this whole cultural bias that we're talking about. And I also think that the Makaya, that the legend that, that he was, I mean, Cricket South Africa, even when his contract ended, Gerald Mojola and myself had that conversation, and he was paid an extra year of salary. It's never happened to any other South African cricketer. He was given an extra year of salary just for his contribution to South African cricket. Uh, there was a game that was also organized for him at Moses Mavida Stadium. So it was never a lack of trying. And I know Gerald was instrumental in that, into in ensuring that Makaya deserves and gets the accolades that he, that he, that he rightly deserves. So, so, so two points there. I mean, let's start with the last one. The, the, the point that he said that, you know, very quickly when, when he played his last game, uh, he, his contract was, was, was dropped or cancelled or null, right? Uh, you're saying that, in fact, this is not true, right? And that's what I need to understand from Mackey because at the time, the last game that he played for South Africa was probably somewhere in January because South Africa contracts continue till the end of uh, the, the financial year and it's probably April. And then you work on another year from there. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually... Uh, positive that he received an extra year's salary after that. Okay, and, and, and that point, and then we'll move on, that, that point about, you know, feeling so lonely. So, so here's the point. If you're feeling that lonely, that you don't want to sit in the bus, 
just help us understand in your 18 month period, I understand that, you know, he played the peak of his career before you became the manager, but you were the team doctor as well. Did you, did you get a sense? I mean, did, did you see him sit in the bus? Let's, let's say that one, one, did he, did he sit in the bus? Uh, and if he sat in the bus, did he sit alone where nobody wanted to talk to him? And did the same level of exclusion, if I want to put it that way, uh, did that also happen in the dressing room, uh, you know, at the training sessions where, where nobody wanted to talk to my client team? As I said, probably prior to, to 2010, prior to the culture camps and that, maybe it did happen. Remember, as a, as a team doctor, I probably was on the, with the tour with the team probably one month a year. It was just overseas tours to the subcontinent. When I took over at manager from 2008, then definitely I was with the team throughout. And even during that time, I mean, I would always uh, joke with him because he would like to sit in the back and I'm saying, are you going to the naughty corner again? And we would laugh about it. But I did not see him. It was never something conscious that he was sitting on his own. I mean, there were always players around there. Uh, I mean, Mondi would tell you, is especially when you go to the UK, when you're sitting in those double-decker buses, sometimes the best seats are right in the end. So personally, I did not see that. Obviously, we need to unpack the way that he felt because obviously he felt all alone. He felt that his teammates let him down. He felt that the administrators let him down. And those are the kind of things that need to come out in a formal setup, or a, a setup okay. like a TRC or something of that nature. Did, did that surprise you when, when he said, you know, when, now, you know we, we, can, we can debate with the fine numbers and if, if I find out actually out of 100 bus stops, maybe maybe sat in the bus. That's not the point, right? The point is he's claiming he felt isolated. But does that point surprise you, uh, Dr. Musaji, based upon what you saw? That, that here's a guy uh, who's iconic in South Africa, but also in world cricket, who's on that Lord's board, on his board. Did that surprise you that, that he of all people would say that? The isolation was surprising. As I said, if somebody comes into cricket from... 93 or say so from 2003 on with somebody coming to cricket and you're the minority in the team setup it's very difficult to feel because you, you're quite nervous of where you fit in but definitely once the the, the, the number of, of players in the squad the players of color the administrators have changed i thought a lot of that isolation would, would, would go away it's, it's similar like if you talk to someone like Hashim when he came into the team he was probably also feeling isolated but as time moved on and the, the numbers in the system had changed. He felt totally different. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for, for your position. Just to tell you, initially, I think the, uh, the plan was 6 to, to 7.30. It was very quickly told me we can go beyond 8 o'clock. So we'll see what happens. Some of you may need to go just now, but we will certainly, uh, we'll talk as long as, I'm happy to talk as long as you guys are. I and mean, certainly many people are asking questions that we'll try and get to that. I want to bring in then Dr. Dr. Eugenia Kula uh, Ameya, who was the chair of the Transformation Committee at, uh, as part of the board at Cricket South Africa. So appreciate your time, Dr. Eugenia Kula Ameya. Thank you. And of course, uh, appreciate uh, some of the thought that you put to me this morning. But firstly, we'll talk about the future just now, right? Uh, I just want to focus, I want you to just focus on what you've heard. If you can go ahead, please. Okay. Thank you, Ashash, and good evening to everybody who's watching. Thank you. I already noted what I've heard. And uh, as a transformation chairperson, I already did my own situational analysis based on what was presented to me during induction, based on the three-hour YouTube in Parliament, and based on other things that players say. Maybe if I go through them quickly, the issue with Roby is the management, that is right, that there were no protocols for reporting, the system was immature, focus on playing the game, you know. It's only said the best defense, actually, is to succeed. I like that spirit. I was even saying to myself, so Manti, Makayantini went through all this, but he was able to come and put up some face and play, you know, to the best of his ability. I said it can only be God. And that all of them, they feel that they, if they had an opportunity to confront issues or they regret that they were not able to confront issues. And Monday was talking about the role of media. I can touch briefly on that. That, that okay, you know it shouldn't be there. Even up to this stage, I, 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 I the media 
is the one fueling racism. I can tell you, the media fuels racism, which is very unfortunate. But I spoke to even one journalist this morning after our meeting, and then waiting for Makaya to retire. Why should it be that? Why should they be the only one person waiting? You know, so you cannot, you cannot, it's not your ability, it's waiting. You can't have so many blacks in the, in the, in the team, in the national team. And the team is not good enough. But the coach has, obviously it will help you. You cannot, you wouldn't know my strength. You wouldn't know what I'm able to do in this board until you open the door. That's what affirmative action sought to do. So you wouldn't know if I'm outside, how would you know if I can cook well? But you've closed the door. So there's nothing wrong in the door being opened. So really it's like people may have to tiptoe around affirmative action. It's law, it's legislation. It's a redress law. So there shouldn't be an apology, even from us as board members. Even the, the, the media must be taken in one room and then be workshopped on law both black and white. Fragmentation, gravitating, you know, by race and was not allowed. I know the years from 2004, 2009, 2010, got left out on international games. As well, let me just say that one. In my induction day on the 19th, it's slide 45 of the presentation. The slide says in an international game, they play 17 games. Then in the 17 games that everybody else played, the Blacks played five games, the Colors played five games, the Indians played five games. So now, in my mind as a strategist, why is that allowed? So are we going to come later and complain that, like one guy said on Twitter, she came from a trip, she got 9,000, the other colleagues got 600,000. So if you don't deal with the root cause, they, they go to play five games, they'll get 5,000 rand. What's the other one who'll be getting 100,000? So it's in the system, the whole thing is in the system from selection. All of them, as what I'll tell you, in the WhatsApp, in the inboxes I get, the issue was in the selection amongst others. And when you complain, they say you've got an attitude, then we are buried alive. The big question, why did I not speak? They're all saying that, you know, the selection practice, you know, if you speak, you're isolated, the use of K-word, K they now want to listen to our story, which is the beauty that we all want to listen to our story. I hear that, that okay, sleep service. You know what I said to, to the players on Sunday? Maybe not because I'm new. Everywhere I've saved, the problem in this country, people enter boardrooms and sit on civil chairs, and then we turn around on our civil chairs, as I'm doing now to this chair, and then we are not held accountable. And it's like we're in some ivory tower, you know? Oh, you sit in the board, yeah, you know? It's service to the nation. It's not about you, it's about the legacy you are supposed to live. It's lip service, inclusivity, and unconscious bias. I'm even happy as well that some of the white players, they are acknowledging it, which is what they've known. They are acknowledging it that it's unconscious bias. You know, they're now apologizing or acknowledging it. You know, so the issue, hence now, if, if I go to the solution, the question will be answered in that closed door. When stories are told, there's a group even of either 29 players, black players who are saying the story of our hardship they play cr cricket up to national level, but they have story of their, of their hardship. That's even the term they are using to define themselves. Over probably two, three decades, they are using a term, the story of our hardship. Why should it be that? Others probably would say the story of our whatever, something positive, you know? So really, is it, is it what this country needs? So the other question, Aswad and colleagues, where he says Makaya was paid to go, or it's a contract not renewed, or it's a performance incentive. When I always say that every case will be looking on its own merits, because I can say something that I don't know. Makaya can say my contract ended. We should be, the doctor is saying, oh, he was paid. Why should I be paid to go? It's like someone saying, okay, well done. We've developed a strategy, now you can go. Why do you remove me? 
to go. That's my question. Luckily, I'm not from cricket, so I'm allowed to ask stupid questions. And my experience is in corporate, in boards, and I can say in HR. In HR, there's a performance incentive when you perform. I guess there was a performance incentive. So if I perform, you give me a performance incentive, why do you then terminate my services? That's a contradiction. That's a fallacy. That's an oxymoron. You, you, you terminate my contract or you don't ensure that I have a contract. Well, you can pay me now. Is it what I want when I'm 29 or 28 or 30 instead of having maybe continue to be part of the system, to part of imparting skills, the, the thing I'm good at, why can't I be allowed to impact that skill? Those are the questions the non-cricketer is asking us. So okay. I'll pause there. The, the one thing I'll say, maybe some statement before I go to the solution. I already spoke about it. The other thing is accountability. Even executives, the executives report to the board. The board's role is to hold executives accountable. And then starting from the board and then driving transformation. If you see that five play games, to me, if I'm here, I'll call you, okay, wh whoever has played a role, I say, please analyze for me. Is a selector, is a captain, is whoever, whoever played a role in this scenario, please explain it to me. Why should others play five and the others play 17? That's my stupid question I asked. Okay. And I'll still ask if it should happen. So I would expect, Anyone, even the CEO, to ask, why did it happen like this? Why is it allowed? I'm sure there's and colleagues in the, in the consulting company that I know, they'll give you six months probation. They'll even teach you how to dress, how to, to eat fork and knife, which glasses for red wine and white wine. If you can't cut it there, then they'll even you know, release you. But you take the contract knowing that we will teach you how to behave in this company, how to represent this company, how to gel in the culture of this company. If you're not, then you are released. So uh, it looks like the players are crying for engagement, you know, secret engagement. They don't want to mention names. There's a lot of talk about the TRC, you know, issues of consequence management. The, the issue of racism, the raci racism exists actually. Even in the same organization, a woman was called a girl. It happens to be maybe another color. How do you call a woman a girl? So someone would think, okay, if I'm a girl, maybe in the apartheid, you know, All time. Right. Can, I, our, can I just interject you? I mean, there's, there's some general comments you're making, but I want to just go specifically. I'm going to the solution. I've got three points. Uh, we'll we'll get to the solutions just now. Just, just give me a minute. We'll get to the okay. solutions just now, right? Um, so, so some of the thoughts, I mean, I, I, I think we accept the fact you've made the point you're not a cricket person, but you're certainly a, you, you're certainly a strategist um, and, and, and transformation is one of the key things yeah. that you strategize around and entrepreneurship, I understand that. Uh, but having just got in now into this critically important position as head of transformation at Cricket SA, right? Just, just a quick okay. one minute comment on when you've heard all these stories, without getting into the details of the stories, when you've heard the Makayas and the Astro Princes and the Hashi Mamlas and maybe the Graham Smiths now and the JPs and, and all these people here today, when you've heard them speaking about Vernon Fernandez as well in the last few weeks, what went through your mind as, as now the person who's entrusted with in fact taking your organization forward on this key issue? Tell us what you felt. Obviously, sadness. I don't want to repeat that, I cried. I felt so sad. So is it what is happening in the, in, in, the, in, in the sporting federation that I serve? But more than that, I move from sadness to develop a solution, who propose a solution. Maybe if you want me to get to that briefly, I can get that because having okay, just, said just now. Is it I, I, will, I will get to that just now, right? Okay. So, okay I felt sad. I felt disappointed. Yeah. I felt disappointed. I felt, I, I feel like, what is it that we can do different? That was like, to me, what is it that, why did, we, why did we allow this? That was my question. I felt like either we failed our, our players, especially the players of color, the black, the colors and the Indians, either we failed them, maybe we also failed some whites, I don't know, but we failed, we abdicated responsibility maybe, but it was said that 
people will go through this year after year and still perform at the top of their okay. of their. I, I yeah. would take it when you when you heard their revelation of the last couple of weeks, right? Um, you were sad, and I and I hear that and disappointed. Uh, two things to to borrow a phrase from the president, President Ramaphosa. Were you a were you also shocked? Meaning, was it a revelation to you? I was shocked. I was shocked. I was really shocked. I didn't expect that. I didn't expect that. I was really shocked. I didn't expect that would have happened because you see a rosy picture. You see them on TV. You see them performing. Even cele we're celebrating them. I was really shocked. Okay. And I, and I take it, you know, any person who's heading up a, a critical division like yours, once you were, you were saddened and shocked, the, the first call you would make would be to your CEO and the president of Cricket South Africa. What did you tell them when you heard what you heard? What I told them, I said, I'm shocked. Obviously we shared some, so we've got a WhatsApp, I shared some shocking, I'll say tweets in the WhatsApp. I said, is it what has been happening? But obviously don't expect an answer. We were all bombarded by various media communication with all this. So, but I asked questions there, but it didn't help to ask. So after I asked and people answer, when I ask, others answer, try to explain, no, it's because of this, it's because of this. Then it breeds, it breeds more answers. I mean, more questions from my side. So nonetheless, alongside that, there was something I was developing. So maybe I'll talk to that. And did, I said, you know what? Any, any senior person like your CEO and your president say, Actually, it's been going on for a long time. We just don't know how to stop. Did, did anybody say something along that line? No, not really. Okay. Not really. You, you made the point, the media fuels racism. Uh, what do you mean by that? The same way Monde spoke about that, he knows himself is not supposed to be there because he's black. There's a media personality who said, even called as capturers, that our game is captured under our own nose. You know? So you we, were, we, were, we were these capturers who don't belong there. They, they're always biases. You know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that there's bias in this reporting. So even one, I had okay. to correct one a few days ago. So there's that. You can see that they made this spot about certain, you know, racial group and then excluding others. So they are fueling it. So as I said, we need to all come into one room and be taught what you are even proposing as part of the strategy going forward. Okay, I just, I just want to pause on that. You, so, so let's say you, what you're saying is correct, that the, the media is fueling racism. I Some, think everyone yes. would jump in and say, but you, know, you can't use a broad word like the media. Some. It would have to be certain. So are there media houses or are there individuals within media that you can point a finger and say, that person from that media house is fueling racism in cricket, because we're talking cricket now, and this is why I say so. This is my example. I can't say that. Maybe when you get to the TRC, I'll go there with evidence. And luckily, I've raised the okay, evidence. Good. I've shared some with the president that here we needed to respond. But sometimes you kind of know, allow it. There's a saying that you used to you say that, the dogs will bark at a moving car. You better move, it's a closer saying, you better move by the dogs who can bark. But really some things you need to pause and say, Ashwat, please explain to me as a media expert, aren't you supposed to report objectively? So what do you mean by this? Because this is not true. But I think sometimes you are not bold enough or you don't want to be derailed because possibly it's a strategy to derail, to derail us from what you're about to do. But in some cases, I really feel others needed to be held accountable if they are really they are real journalists. Because there's a journalistic code of conduct for every journalist. Okay, so I'm just just clearing this. I mean, obviously, if there's if there's misconduct from journalists, it will be the editors and maybe the South African National Editors Forum to get involved. But on the one hand, we talk about unconscious bias from let's say white South Africa, right? Um, but. but it may not happen today, but at some stage in your TRC, somebody's going to come up with the media and say, well, give us facts and figures. 
do you not think if, if you don't have the facts and figures that then you could also be accused of being unconsciously biased um, in terms of suggesting that it's just the media? No, I said some, I can point one, two, three. I can have a number and I have evidence. I have, and I've analyzed the thing and I've okay. written, I've sent some to the president. So I said some and we see the consistency. So some. Yeah, right. I'll say some, the, the especially point. with this, that, with some, I, 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 could, I could give it to you to say, look, at, read this article. If there's an article that says, me and Monde are the best, we are this, and then it will say someone else is, is useless, is this, you know? Everywhere, when you say something, in law, it says, you know, the one who alleges must provide evidence. So it's because we don't hold them accountable. We don't hold journalists accountable. Some people are out to push a certain agenda. So, but then you would rather focus on that or move forward. So people need to be held accountable. Similar, right. when I say accountability, it starts with the board. Already the, the nation is holding us accountable. They are angry, they are hurt, they are holding us accountable. They ask, what are you doing? We are bombarded with messages, what are you doing? You know, so we are held accountable. Everybody's supposed to be held accountable. I said to one, okay. we cannot okay. go okay. back to... Okay. But, mm. All right, the, the last two questions for now, I mean, the, the Makai and Tini one, just to clear it up, I think my understanding from what Dr. Mohamed Musaji said, and, and if I'm wrong, he can raise his hands on this one. He said, even after Makai stopped playing, because he had a contract, as many other players, he had a contract for another year. I, are you suggesting uh, from, from your side, Dr. Uh, Eugenia uh, Kula, that in fact, he was paid to not play any longer, almost like told, we're going to pay you, now stop playing. I mean, I, I had a sense that's what you said. So, so just to clear that up. I'm, I'm saying the same people, let's say, I, I get anytime I, I talk even to the radio, especially African radio, they will ask that you have executives, you have people who played with Manti, with Makai and Tini, why can't you start holding them accountable? I'm consistent in saying every case should be looked at in its own merits. You cannot say because Eugenia said this, it is wrong, you know? So in, in, in any story, there's mine, there's yours, and there's a truth. So there'll be a process for that, to check this, whether it was a payoff. As I'm saying, from an HR perspective, when you perform well, you get a performance bonus. Was it a performance bonus? Was it payoff that you probably get rid of you, maybe make room for Monday? Or was it, well, is it what he wanted? Was he engaged? to say, what are the options? What do you want? Do you want a contract? Do you want a performance bonus? Do you want a year pay? That would be, look at it on its own merits. Okay, the, the last but thing now, right? And the, the doctor says thing. this, in that closed door, then everybody will bring their version. Maybe there'll be four, then the truth will come out. Fair enough. All right, so the last thing for now, last thing for now, you, you made the point about the media needs to be workshop in law, right? Uh, are you suggesting that that's a cricket South Africa role? Or, or, no. or that be, you know, the, 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 the editors? Maybe media houses, they should get a, you know, their own workshop to say, when we talk affirmative action is law, when there's this, this, just that, because there's no way you can be reporting and be dividing the nation every time you report. You're reporting clearly, the whites are good, the blacks are bad. Like it says, you are there because of a quota. Someone can say, I'm in this board because I'm a black woman. I've got nothing to offer. You see, if a, a journalist says that, then that is bias. You know, whether you call it unconscious, because that's a nice word that we use, unconscious, but that's bias. That's not true. So I should be able to say, okay, I thought you say I'm here because of affirmative action, because I'm black, because I'm a woman. So are you saying I don't have any other thing to offer? I'm not qualified. I'm not experienced. Okay. That's the okay. question. But you don't get to ask them that question. But then it's allowed that that person is like this. It's because it's a woman, because it's black. That's a simple example I'm making. Okay. But okay. you see Thank that you. trend with some journalists. Right. What okay. I'm going to do now, so, so I mean, Busi Siwe, of course, representing uh, the Katana Foundation, I, I'm very happy to continue talking beyond the, the, the allocated time of 8 o'clock, right? Um, uh, what I would like to do then is uh, two things from your side, Busi, if you can help me. Um, if you can just, just pick up, there's a series of questions being asked. Now, I can't go through all because of time, but I'm going to ask you uh, to maybe highlight uh, five or six of the most important questions relevant to this particular 
discussion today, uh, as opposed to general commentary, right? So specific no. questions that I'll, I'll put. Mm. Uh, so, so Bruce, see if you can do that. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, rely on you to, to assist me on this one. In the meantime, while we're waiting, let, let's think, let's just do a- Can I just finish one minute, Ashrat? What you do you want to say? We, we go to the talk about going forward just now. Okay, all right. I'm okay. coming to that now. I'm going to do. I do. I want to cut to you last. I want to get to the players first. Right. So, so right. let's get to the batting order once again. Robbie Peterson. So you've heard many things, right? For you, you you did say you're here because you want solutions, right? There's lots of things you're unhappy with, but you love the game of cricket, right? So, what for you, based upon what you've heard? Uh, Robbie P, would would you see as the solution going forward now? And you're a player, your views are really important. Do, do we have Robbie there? Yeah. Maybe not. Oh, he's there. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, he's here. He's here. I think um, not player anymore, but uh, coach in the system. Um, I think what's happened. Um, coming back into the system and into changing rooms, I found it very, um, um, what's the word for broken, very divided. I think what's happened is that the policies that we have in our cricket at the moment are a little bit outdated, our transformation policies, if we're completely honest with ourselves. We need to have a check-in process where we reevaluate those again. Do they align with high performance and what we want in our country? Um, I think, um, you know, where do you draw the line? We, we're starting to call people black African, colored, you know. I mean, it, as a coach at the moment, it's incredibly difficult. My, my main job is to try and keep a united changing room. And I find with all these, or all these um, silos people are put into, it's creating more division than anything else. Um, I'm not sure what the answer is right now, Asha, but I do think that, we, as people that have to implement policy, have to be consulted in the process. You know, we cannot implement policy and policy makers are, are not consulting us. I think we need to get into a room, hash it out, see what works, what doesn't, and come up with a new solution. I think, the, 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 for me, the most disappointing thing that, that's happened is, where's our grassroots cricketers? You know, if we talk about transformation, we need to go and investigate why our players not playing cricket at that level anymore because that's where it starts. We cannot build a house on weak foundations. You know, ultimately, I feel that we've had the carpet, you know, pulled out uh, underneath us. Um, we need to go and re-evaluate um, how we're going to grow the game, especially in the townships. You know, uh, I think that's where we can start with transformation. Not, I mean, uh, there are a lot of things that are being bandied out. There are going to be road shows and all sorts of stuff. I think we can, you know, we, we've got to get more creative than that, you know, to grow the game. Um, I do think that uh, we need to have a consultative approach, a more collaborative approach, because what, what we're creating at the moment is people fighting each other in dressing rooms, and, and that's not the place we want to be. You know, um, we want to have a, a united South Africa and... Um, and policy needs to reflect that. At the moment, it's not. Do, do you think, I understand that there's a new, you know, cricket's got this new social justice forum that's been set up. Right? Many people are suggesting that, that the playing side, the cricketers and the coaches are, are not being consulted. I mean, you, you're a coach, former player. Uh, have you been consulted? What, what are your thoughts about that? I don't, we've never been consulted in terms of policy. I think um, what we'd like, I think what needs to happen is you have to have a more, consultative, collaborative approach with people that have to implement your policy. You cannot put policy in place, expect people to just go and implement it. You sit there for another three years and then revisit it. I think what we need to do is have an ongoing um, process where we keep checking in, is it working or is it not? You know, okay, maybe we need to tinker it here and there. So it has to be a fluid situation at the moment. I, I think it's too cut and dry where three, you need to pick five of that, three of that, two of that. And, at the moment, that's not working because that's not how a cricket team works at the end of the day. You have to pick a team of 11 of different skills to try and get your team over the line. And I think yeah, we just need yeah. to bear that in mind a little bit that we're still playing a game of cricket here. Okay. And, um, you know, we, we have to be cognizant of, the cognizant of the fact that we do have a divided past two. So we need to um, bear that in mind. 
but I think we need to get more creative. I don't know what the solution is right now, but I think the relevant people need to start being consulted and implemented. And we need to get around the table and put our heads together because this is not going away and we need to solve it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, well, hopefully there'll be some questions that maybe you can answer just now, right? Mondi Zodeki, again, looking, looking to the future, what would you want to see happen now? Uh, um, yeah, I, I agree with uh, a lot of what Bobby has said, uh, something that we privately spoken about many times in the past. Um, I, grassroots to me is, is, is where I think is very important um, because I've, I've, I've been lucky enough in the last couple of years to um, be a selector in the national under-19 team, uh, which Robbie was a part of at some at some point. Um, so we went to the same camps. Is that I, I think the school system is very fluid in many ways. Um, just how they select schools, for example. Um, I had an easy example that I used the other day to someone. Um, luckily, they got it right with one kid from South Africa because they had scouts that go out there and go look for talent. But there was a young man who was playing for the second team at Marysburg College. Um, and he was invited to one of our camps because someone had seen him uh, bowling randomly somewhere. And the next day, that same year, the guy was playing second team at Marysburg College, was picked to play for South Africa under 19. So to be playing second team for your school, but then the same year to represent your country, um, be one of the best of the best in the country, but you can't even make your starting level of your school. There's a huge problem there. Um, and people always make jokes about, oh, but if the father who's got a lot of money sponsors all the kids, his son will never be dropped. Um, I think that's where root, where certainly development um, and more work can be put in into searching and finding these kids. Um, I think we've slapped off over, over the last couple of years. And, and as a result, our under-19 team has uh, really struggled over the, the last couple of years. Um, I mean, I could give you other stories. Aiden Markram must have been picked for the, the Titans in the 19th time, and he was invited to camp and ended up capturing the, the team that won the World Cup. So, grassroots to me is very important, and to bring those kids up and to find them and to nurture them to the right system to make sure that we are selecting the right kids and we're also not missing out on a lot of talent uh, that is still out there but don't have opportunity. And the opportunities could be of many reasons, it doesn't have to be just race. Um, so, you know, it's, it's grassroots again, and we can work a lot better, and we need to change what we're doing right now, because I don't think the way the system is set up right now is working. Yeah, so let me ask you this. I mean, I'm looking at your, your own position, uh, Monty, you know, playing, uh, coming through the Dale College uh, system, and then we look at yeah. uh, the, the, the Sia Colisi, the captain of the, of the Springbok team, talking about this, this break where the coach identified him. Uh, and then got him recommended to school, which effectively changed his life and then changed the destiny of the country in terms of winning the World Cup, right? But the key in, in all those cases, including the Makai and Teenies and maybe many others too, is they had to leave a township and get to a, a smart school, in inverted commas, uh, and, and, and then deliver in that smart school. And, that's, uh, and then, of course, uh, move through up the ranks, right? Uh, one of the issues I felt strongly about, and I've spoken about it uh, when I program director of the Gauteng legislature budget, right, was that we'll know South Africa is transformed fully when our townships look like suburbs. The point I want to make to you, Mondi, is like, do you feel that not enough, so a lot of effort is being put in identifying quality black players and then taking them out of the townships, but not enough is being put into ensuring that townships start resembling suburbs and in cricketing terms, meaning the development of cricketing schools in townships of such a high level that white cricketers from smart schools in suburbs will want to run to play for those schools. So can you give me your thoughts on that one? Day? Yeah, I'm, I'm, the last part, I'm not too sure about, about them running to those schools, but um, I'm 100% with you. I think that our schools, our facilities, um, coaching, so much of it has to be directed at the townships because you'll find that the one or two talented black guys who live in those townships and go to those schools might get seen by someone somewhere and they'll yank him out of that system and put him to a school or to a system where he's very uncomfortable, um, but he, sometimes he thrives. So if you go back and you look at all the black players who played for South Africa, I bet you over 90% of them went to a Model C school. And some of them sent it through bursary 
um, or some of them, you know, be, being seen at a 17 tournament or something like that. But I just think about how much talent, um, even just growing up in the Eastern Cape, which has been the bedrock of black cricketers for the longest time, um, how many have slipped through the gaps because socially or where they come from, there was no cricket, um, people gave up on them, um, or they just couldn't afford to go to a good school and they weren't able to be playing cricket every weekend uh, because the club system is, is falling apart. So there's so much that can be done uh, in terms of fixing those areas instead of trying to yank every one of those good players um, and send them to a Gray or a Dale College. Uh, Makai is a perfect example of that. He got to Dale when he was 16, um, but he struggled to adapt because by that time, um, you know, he hadn't spoken a lot of English and it took him a long time to try and adapt. In fact, he didn't even finish his schooling at Dale. Um, so, you know, to take someone who's 16, 17 and go put him um, at a Model C so-called white school just to get better, um, a better coaching or, or, or to, to, to play more games, I think it would be a lot easier if we just kept them in those townships, but improve the townships rather instead of going the other way around. Yeah, good point. Okay, let's, uh, th thank you for that, uh, Mondi. Let, let's bring in then uh, JP, JP, Jimmy, JP, again, looking forward to some, some of the thoughts you'd like to uh, punctuate. Yes, yeah, so, so uh, two things come to mind for me. I think if we, I, I spoke a little bit earlier about acknowledgement, right? So the crux for me, uh, the crux of the issue uh, for me is head and heart transformation. So transformation is something that has become such a hum humongous uh, sort of topic of conversation for us. But do we under, really understand what transformation is? So my understanding of, from a South African context and a cricket context, what does it look holistically? It looks like we need to have X amount of players that represent South Africa. So for me, that is a ticking box scenario. And we need to understand that if we're going to be focused externally, which is the tick box, we're not going to transform. Transformation for me is a heart transformation, a head and heart transformation. So we can't expect players, we can't expect our country to transform if there's not an internal transformation first. So we can't have the external, so we need to transform on the inside. And the second thing that I want to mention is, and it's almost a direct um, suggestion to Dr. Eugenia, is that I believe, so, so let, me, let me give you some context. So I'm an ambassador for Spirited Cricket, right? And the essence of spirited cricket is to understand where we've come from and where we're going. Now, I believe that spirited cricket has a part to play in the road forward. I believe that we have a, a model which is called Transformation 2.0 that we can, we can talk about and suggest to you that, that I think that from a South African context point of view that we can take on board and implement within South African cricket. And for, for us, it's actually a thought process of globally, but I think for, for us now, it's, it's important to focus on, on, on nationally. So those, those are the two aspects that come to mind. And, you know, this, this, this thing about transformation has been so topical in our country, and it, it needs to go beyond just the understanding of, as I said, the external, and what transformation represents is opportunity. So opportunity can't just be a name on a team sheet. The, 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 and, and that is unfortunately what the main focus has been from a government point of view. We need to understand that players that represent certain teams need to be skilled enough. They need to get proper opportunities. And what Robbie and, and particularly Monday is, is mentioning around uh, the grassroots, we, we, we we have to be honest with ourselves, there hasn't been enough focus on gross ticket. And, and I want to bring this point up, uh, Mr. God, is that I, I've got a foundation, right? JP21 Foundation. And the main purpose of the foundation is to revive the game of cricket in a local community, the community that I'm from, which is Mitchell's Play and Sunday. That is over a million people in that community, right? 54 primary schools alone in this community. Five years ago, we started this foundation to revive the game of cricket. Only four were playing. Only four primary schools were playing cricket, right? To date, we've managed to, to accomplish to have 38 schools uh, playing the game of cricket. Now, my point is this. We can't have a situation 
and 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 I'm and I'm saying this because I believe this is the way the way forward. We can't have a situation where I'm having to fund myself and and finding corporate sponsors. We can't have that situation where that is the only way right now where these kids are going to have an opportunity to play the game. That just doesn't work. If if we having a transformation policy where there's millions and millions of rands budgeted for transformation, that fund, those funds need to be distributed properly. And I think from a South African public point of view, we and they, as as past players and they want to know what is being what is happening with millions and millions of rands that has been allocated to transformation. Where is that going? Where what does that represent? Because the local communities are suffering. The local communities are suffering. We need to create an even playing field for players of the local communities and disadvantaged communities to be able to compete with the mainstream schools. You can't have a situation, and we alluded to this too from Monday. The transformation can't be taking, taking a, a, a black African or colored player out of a community and putting him in a mainstream school and that's your transformation. It has to be the other way around. Why are we not seeing trans why are we not seeing local mainstream schools investing back into the community? Why can't they adopt a adopt the school policy even? I mean these these millions and millions of rands flowing within the mainstream schools. Can we as as a as a government, as a, a as a community really come together and say, right, let's help one another? We need to we need to get to a point where we're really leaning on one another and helping one another to to really further the game. The game the game needs to be spread into the community as well. You can't take the player out of the community. You need to go back into the community. So, so I mean, on, on that point, I mean, do do you agree? Even as someone who's played the game at, at the highest level, right? That that naturally we all wanted to move away from a completely white apartheid South African cricket team, and, and we've done that, right? But there's, there's been too much focus, therefore, on the numbers now, right? That means, okay, we're okay because we've got four black players, and I'm using the word black holistically, right? Or we're okay, we've got six black players, right? But true transformation, and I'm really borrowing from what you're saying, you know, sometimes when you, you need to have a measurement, okay? Because sometimes it can be very bland otherwise. So is the measurement of transformation that we need to have six or seven black players out of 11, right? Or is the measurement of transformation that we need to measure how many township cricket school, township schools are now fully fledged cricket schools? Because if, if we get that right, then we wouldn't be having the discussion about how many black players emerge because they will emerge naturally. You know, you all, and, and it touches on all the things you've said already. I'm just making that point very pointedly. Should transformation be measured by that? How many schools become cricket schools from township? So I think that's the outcome. When you, when you talk about representation of uh, should we have a measurement? But for me, the measurement is, I, I would like to, and I think all of us would like to see a, so let's use Cape Town as an example. I would like to see a school from Mitchell's Plain play against a school, a mainstream school, let's call it Bishops, for instance, and compete at an elite level. So how are we going to do that? We need to develop infrastructure. We need to provide opportunities through better facilities. I mean, if you look just at that community alone, we don't have facilities. We don't have proper facilities for them to train. We don't have proper coaching for them to, to gain experience. It's all about the love of the game. And what happens when you find somebody within that community that does well, they get taken out of the community and put in, put in a mainstream school. And I'm guilty of that in a way as well, because we've got a bursary program. So what we're trying to do in the immediate is we're trying to take kids out of the community and put them in mainstream schools so that they can have better opportunities. But what I've come to realize through my own, through over the past couple of weeks, through my own education by talking and, and, and communicating with people around me is that we're doing it in the wrong way. And yeah, I thought I'm doing, I'm doing my community uh, uh, you know, I'm serving my community, but actually I'm doing an injustice in a way because I'm taking them out of their comfort. We need to be plowing back in. And that for me is part of the solution right there. Yeah. Well, well I think the point, you know, uh, I see Mohammed Marjib just commented, not just schools, clubs. I, I mean, you're spot on Mohammed Marjib just commenting, it's yeah. schools, clubs, ditto, that one of the, the areas that came up 
uh, JP was that when, when cricket transformed or united uh, in 92 or whatever it was, that effectively, you know, Newlands Cricket Ground uh, became the, the so-called Mecca of the Western Cape, or Wanderers became the Mecca of, of cricket in, uh, uh, in the unified South Africa, whereas in reality, there were, there were established cricket fields in black communities all around the country that seemed to have been waylaid. But I think your point is very valid. Uh, I'm going to just say this by myself. I'm going to personally try and connect with you with a partnership of schools called Partners for Possibility, and they've got nothing to do with cricket. Okay? But they have developed a system of, of getting experts from outside to literally adopt schools, and they've, and they've won global awards for that. And they're based in the Western Cape, by the way. I will endeavor to see how we can adapt that model to a cricketing mm. model. None of those people leave those schools. They're in the township. Okay? Something yep. to, to consider. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Musaji, let me bring you in there. Uh, we'll get to questions just after this as well. Some people ask some questions. Mohamed, just, just on this point, I think it's important, and then, then we'll talk about your way forward here. Because you've been involved in the transformation process of, uni of unity in 92. Do you, do you think that sport became this political expediency for the politics of the day to move away from a, from a sacros sports policy of no normal sport in an abnormal society and here i'm putting it directly to to the ruling party the african national congress which many of us have voted for all through the years right um to literally drop the hardline approach as a way of appeasing white south africa and getting sport back into international cricket in 92 i think it is even before we we voted for the first time and with hindsight that particular drive in fact it didn't accelerate the transformation process. It actually slowed down the, the transformation process. Your thoughts on that? Mohammed, go ahead, yeah? I said you, you're spot on. But when it, was, when it came to 1992, where Unity took place, that time I was a player similar to Robbie P and JP and probably in the prime of your career. And at that time, I honestly felt that our administrators let us down because they went into the unity too easily, they sacrificed a lot, and it was to appease the politicians, no doubt. And if we look back, and that's why I'm saying, without the TRC, how do you move forward? How do you get to a place? We all know, we all accept the transformation is a journey, it's not a destination, we all understand it. I mean, my main focus and the ultimate aim when we leave here tonight is that we should primarily be focusing on a non-racial and inclusive community, right? We should be focusing on that. But at the same time, we need to acknowledge a few things. We need to acknowledge that if you continue to have problems in the, in the boardroom, it's also going to impact on your ability to transform. You've got to accept that. And I mean, it's, it's refreshing that Cricket South Africa has come out now with a strategic response to deal with issues of racism and discrimina uh, discrimination. But at the same time, let us not forget that this is the same Cricket South Africa board that has had a litany of corporate governance failures. And at this moment in time, they lack the credibility. The governing structure, have they, entered, uh, have they acted in the best interest of cricket itself? And that's a question mark. There's multiple disputes with the most important sector, the most important stakeholders, and that, that, that's the players themselves. Okay, so let's look forward. The way I look at it, we desperately need what we call a thorough and a focused TRC. And there we need a platform for players, and coaches to make honest and thorough submissions for the purpose of educating all those involved in cricket. This will allow for a greater understanding of the challenges and it will start providing solutions. But there's a proviso. If this TRC is going to have any credibility, the current board cannot run with this. You need independent people. You need independent people that have a passion for the game to run with this TRC. I have to say also that Far too many of our administrators currently, and I say this with respect, are lining their pockets with significant amount of money in the form of direct fees without taking into account corporate governance, nor serving with the integrity and the passion that is required to serve. Okay? On a second point then, when you spoke about media earlier, I think you need what we call due and proper recognition of the history of black cricket, black, especially black, black cricketing excellence. And I think the media can assist in a hell of a lot in that regard. Because that's, when you, that's how you start remove the, removing the unconscious bias. 
The third point I want to make is that, and Robbie P, as well as JP spoke about it earlier, is that if you want to foster and nurture, you need to start fostering and nurturing what we call black team excellence. We can't be on the back foot now and say that we want individual black excellence to be integrated into so-called white teams. It can't work, not in today, not in the South Africa of 2020, okay? The last two points I want to make is that as far as the coaches are concerned, you need coaches that are dedicated to the cause. You need coaches with the broad view of what the best interest for South Africa is. And I look at somebody like Rusty Rasmus. If you really think about him, what happened two years before the World Cup? I mean, he was a laughing stock. People thought that, ah, oh, we're not going to even perform at the World Cup. But who are the best players at the World Cup? So you need someone to buy in and to have the vision, both for on the field and off the field. And I think the last point I want to make is that as we sit here today, we need to break down the divisions that have developed amongst us, the previously disadvantaged communities. The divisions that intensified under the leadership of a few misguided individuals, because by driving only an Africanist agenda, it's become a racially biased agenda. We need to make sure that we're looking at the non-racial and inclusive cricket community and take this transformation journey forward. Do, do you think, you know, when we talk about cricket having a, having a problem, I, I'm just thinking we can say ditto to 10 other things in the country. Right? So my thought then is, do you think the issue of racism in cricket, in fact, is not a cricket problem, it's a societal problem, Dr. Musaji, and, and therefore needs to be seen in that context? Without a doubt, I mean, cricket is just a microcosm and a reflection on, on, the, on the greater society. I mean, there's huge challenges in, in the country as we sit. So there's no doubt that you can almost infer and marry the two. And, and therefore, this TRC you talk about then, shouldn't the, 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 the cricket TRC actually be the rugby TRC, the education TRC, the arts and culture TRC, blah, 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 and all of that part of, of, of a new national TRC that must almost be deliberately not being run by government. It needs to be done by, by independent people with a completely new vision. Do you not think that it should just cascade down and cricket just be one of them? Or do you think it should be bottoms up, everyone does their own thing? I mean, that, that's an excellent point. I mean, who polices the police? You can't be judge and jury in this matter. The board can't police themselves. The TRC has to be run by independent uh, people. And if we look at the board as being part of the problem, they can't be deemed to be the savior. You need independence. There's no two ways about it. And it is a reflection on what's happening in greater society. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, let's leave it at that for, for, for now. Oh, yeah, just maybe the last thing to you, Dr. Uh, Mohamed Musaji, the, the, this new social justice forum that we'll certainly going to get uh, uh, a cricket essay representative to talk about in a moment, right? Are you supportive of that at this point in time or, or, or not? I'm supportive if it's run independently. It can't be run by Cricket South Africa. I'm definitely supportive if it's run independently because Cricket South Africa will have to make submissions to that. Okay, got that. Thank you. Well, let's then, uh, so, uh, Bruce Siwa has got some questions, but I think before that, let's just get the, the Cricket SA response of the, the way forward, including uh, that point around uh, this, this new social justice, or whatever that, that really means. We all want to find the doctor, uh, Eugenia Kula, and where we thank thanks once again for your time. Then some of the practical things going forward for you. Do we, uh, Bruce, see what just helped us? Do we, do we have uh, Eugenia with us? I think we know. just, so, yeah. I had to unmute. <laughs> thank you, Asha. Okay. okay, go ahead. Can I go ahead? Yeah, please do. Okay, okay, yeah. I, I think the, the board criticism is unfair. You had to say, when you say someone is wrong, you must say she's done this and that. And I'm saying with greatest respect because I'm new in the board. Because if there's anything you need to point, the same issue I was saying with the, with the media. So it's easier to, to end. Besides, the issue that is quoted, I think the matter was closed. So I, I, I note, uh, Ashwa, that the issues of policy review, as a new person, I was told that there were, there were two transformation in the habits. I assume Robbie would have been part of that. If the colleagues feel that that is not sufficient, there should be smaller focus group, either for selectors, for coaches, that is something, it's a good proposal. So maybe the big endeavor with everybody in the room, maybe once in two years, 
maybe it doesn't work, that needs to be reviewed. Um, I, I, I think I agree with that. The issue of consultation, it's true that the fiber of the society, racism is a socio-economic issue. And this division, I'm not sure if there's anything that drives an African agenda. That's why I say when you make a statement, someone must qualify it. So when you say black or we say affirmative action, it's clear it will include Chinese even. So that's why I say maybe it's a policy ignorance or what, I'm not sure. So let's understand policy. When it says black, it says African, colored, Indians, Chinese, as long as they were born here. So let me maybe that bit of education just right there. And the grassroots level. My question I was asking, people were playing cricket in the street. There's a book where legends are recorded by Cricket South Africa. They play cricket in township, in the street, in villages. So the, 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 the method or the approach that you take them from township to schools, that needs to be reviewed. That's what I was saying. Why can't they play here? Because if my father hasn't got a car to take me to Dale, but I can play in the village 10 kilometers from King Williamstown, where Dale is, why don't they play the football? I mean, the, the thing there, the cricket there. In football, soccer, the white parents or those staying, who stay in suburbs, they take their children to township clubs. To down, so it could be that reverse because things are done this way. We need to think outside the box. Outside the box, that will really help us. Then I'll get to the issue. There are various initiatives. Thank you for helping our colleague about the foundation. There's one, even one program of experience that is the path. You know that talks about your action, your, your know, vision and action and action plan and a mission. So when we can teach young people, is doing a great job with the foundation. That's very good. We commend that. We can see how we partner for with any good initiative, the same way you've done. Getting to the Cricket South Africa solution. One, we came with a Cricket for Social Justice and Nation Building. It's our response strategy as a CSA board to the Black Lives Matter and all the racist allegations. It has four pillars. I think it's simple. The first pillar is the Office of the Transformation Ombudsman. If you understand Ombudsman, how it's formed, it's, it's, a, it's an independent platform, independent office altogether. It will be like public protector. The university has it. It reports to council, not to the structure of the executives. So it's an office of the transformation Ombuds that will deal with all the issues. The purpose is that, Alshad and colleagues, that we don't have to get young ones waiting for 10 years, all this, in the panel now, they said, I wish I had an opportunity to speak. I didn't raise it. So issues will be raised through a process that can be referred for further investigation with the ombudsman. Because now we, we, everybody can say, no, it was a bias. So let it be tested there. We are already disagreeing whether Mark Haya was a performance bonus or this. The process can be checked. You know, it can be investigated. That's one pillar. The second pillar is to engage, heal, and restore. People are hurt. The nation is hurt. If it's us here, I heard this podcast is oversubscribed. The nation is hurt. Those who looked up for Mantini, who, those who admired the, the Mondays of this world, they are hurt. So the people go through this. As far as priests, they go through this. So the nation needs to be healed and restored. That's what is done now, even going to the vernacular radios to say, yes, there's pain. Yes, we've heard, but this is the action. That's the second pillar. The third pillar that we're exploring, don't ask me how we'll get the funding, is a restoration fund, where people have been pushed out of their jobs, where they could be, say, with the, looking at the modalities, coming with a formula that people will be compensated. Or if someone has a foundation, it could be sponsored. Because others, they were pushed off in their prime of their career, or they were overlooked. So we're looking into that. The last one, which is important, because we're dealing with a systematic issue, we can cut, we can cut the, the, the branches, but we need to deal with the root. So it's called root cause analysis. So the, that fiber of the society, there's a program called DIPS, which deals with diversity, inclusive, inclusion, and belonging. You can be having blue eyes, mine are brown, but we all need to appreciate that we need to coexist. From homes, 
Even the, the schools actually are calling me, the governing bodies, they even want, they realize that it should start there, you know? So we will come with the integrated system. It's, we might not even see the fruits of it now. The process of TRC or whatever, you no know, ombudsman, that everybody supports that. Truth must be, must be told and time to heal. Sometimes you say, no, I've passed it over. When you repeat it again, and the other one is sitting opposite you, people cry. So that's why there wasn't be psychologists, that's my counselors in my view, you know? So there's a process, it's a systematic thing, but that starts from the 13 year olds, from the 14 year olds that you must coexist, you are different, you are tall, you are short, but you must exist then. You must understand that I don't have to feel isolated. I don't have to isolate you. I must appreciate that. I made an example to a white colleague who called me. I said, in our African culture, if someone comes, you are eating, I just wash my hand, join you and eat. But if I go to another culture, I'll be offered coffee, sit in the sitting room, while people are eating on the table. How do we marry the two? Do I give you a scones or a sandwich? Because we didn't count. So that's where we need to. You know, it's a process, but you need to deal with that, understanding everybody's culture. Then even when you go outside the country, you understand that, how you behave. Then I remember last time when we went to America, those days early, they would even tell you that you don't cross the, re the road robots or traffic lights, you get a ticket. We South Africans with our, what have you, someone crossed the robot, got a ticket light. Even the induct you, when you go to America, how you deal with police. So those are the kind of things that we even need in our systems, understanding diversity. Having stayed in England and worked in England, you cannot be a manager in a certain company I work for without being trained in diversity. That the Pakistani male will talk, they talk this way or how they think of women. Now, before you manage, then you understand that. So if you say these are the values, you know, this is our checklist. If you don't display what is in the checklist, really then we are not leaving the culture of CSA. So those are the kind of a systematic approach that you are looking into. Okay. In township, I was talking to a colleague now, sometimes the, the, the equipment or whatever the fields get vandalized. I say we should find a system of ownership with the communities. Why should someone not come and destroy the equipment that is beneficial to the community? So it's a systematic thing that involves parents. A racist is not born, but is taught. Okay. Whether it's a black racist or a white racist. So those are the systematic things that a bit that you can do a cricket, partnering with schools, with governing bodies, they're already reaching out to say, we are in this, we want to start it in our school level. So I think briefly, there are those four pillars, Office of the Transformation on Boots, the and engage, hence we're engaging here, healing the nation, engage, heal and restore. People are ahead. You know, restore them. How do we say now? I don't want to talk about it. The fact that you are saying that in psychology, it still hurts you. You don't want to bring the pain. You are, it's avoidance. It's called avoidance. So people must talk about things, cry if they want to cry. Even men cry, cry and then hug each other and then we move forward. And okay. then the last, a transformation fund and DIPS program. Okay. So that's the immediate strategy, a response strategy by the board. Okay. The one that is said to be Thank what you. What I'm going to do now, I always realize that if we can stop at eight, we could probably stop at nine. So maybe that's the way to take it. Uh, see, see if you can just help me with, with uh, identifying some of the key questions that we can put forward now to people. There's, there's a lot of comments, I understand that, right? Um, and before I do that, just, just to Eugenia once again, right? Uh, a very quick answer on this one here. How, I mean, what you're saying is so complex. It's, it's like a two hour debate on its own, right? But I take it, you, how would you personally, as the head of the transformation committee, how are you going to measure your own success? Okay, thanks, I tried for that. Yes, I think by the grace of God, who gave me this concept, I've done scorecards in my life where you pay business unit bonuses based on scorecards. There's a course that I've even done in ITC ILO, it's called result measurement. There's a way to measure results. If we said to the players on Sunday, you need to hold us accountable, we'll be able to measure results. And where we failed, we'll identify where the bottleneck is and communicate. That's why it's called performance appraisal. Once you appraise the CEO, the board also has a performance appraisal system. And this is 
out of passion, everybody in the board, even council members, they support this initiative. And uh, I, can, I can bet, you know, I'll say with my God that it will succeed. Everybody supports it. We realize we cannot be complaining about this. This is part solution. It's just one of the solutions to deal with the past, which the Office of the Obus will do. And then we focus on this engagement that Rob is talking about. As I have a small focus group, see how we set your townships. But there will be results. After three years, that accountability, that's what you say, even annually, we don't have to wait for three years. Okay, I can. Okay. I can I, I can bet for that to say there will be there will be delivery. Well, there I think we all delivered. want that to be right. Whatever our different strategies, one thing we want to get right is cricket to be transformed, thriving, right. and and us to win the World Cup amongst other things that just by the way should happen. Right. What I'll do, maybe, we'll see if you can help us now. Maybe, maybe, maybe Robbie, maybe we need a policy in 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 cricket to win a World Cup. Who oh, knows? In fact, we <laughs> How much joke can say that? Thank you. All right, uh, we'll see. We're just. Uh, uh, if you can help us now with, with identifying some questions, maybe you can read it out, Bush, see where and, and uh, uh, if it needs to be directed to one individual, then, then we'll do that. Otherwise, we'll, we'll get one person to volunteer. We can't get one question answered by four or five people. We won't have a time. Uh, so just help me with that, please. Sure. Um, I think the, the lovely thing is that most of the, the, the comments have been conversations amongst our audience, but um, there's just a few that I picked up here. One person is, says the question is, how did we untransform hair people of color in leadership positions at CSA? Um, someone has commented that the need for organic transformation where cricketing schools are built in township is required to ensure that players are comfortable and perform op optimally. The idea has been sidelined um, by cricket development. What is the role of transformation committee, the board and organization over this period that has bred an environment where players feel unsafe to speak? Uh, why are we still having these problems despite CSA saying they're pursuing a transformation agenda? Um, uh, why do we exclude players, coaches, and support staff when we have conversations on transformation? And then lastly, why does Cricket South Africa or have a plan of action already, you know, what recommendations without having completed the listening and recording and unpacking the experiences of players? Thank you. And those are the, the, the comments and questions that we have picked up. Okay, I think I'm back there now. Uh, all right, I heard that, but, but it seems from what you're saying that most of the things have been either discussed or or would require another whole half an hour of each one of them, right? So, the, so there's nothing. I mean, is there anything specific, Bushy? See whether you think that can be answered now. That besides the general commentaries that are that are there in the uh, in the chat in the chat room. No, I think nothing needs to be answered. I think most of the stuff here has been covered in um, the conversations, but I think uh, what would be important to know is how has Cricket South Africa gotten to this point where they already have a plan of action when they have not completed, you know, the discussions with um, current and former players. Okay, maybe let, let's get Eugenia to answer that one there. So I think it's come from Ilham Pulabad, I think it is, uh, you know, Aren't you not doing the cart before the horse? What, why not first go on a consult at the forum and then come back with very clear recommendations, Eugenia? Hi, thank you, Robbie, for that. And thank you to whoever asked that question. I think leaders are supposed to lead. I'm wondering if you go to consult and say, consulting on what? You bring a framework to say, this is a skeleton. You can put your flesh. And if I ask you this concept, it's probably it was approved on, on Tuesday last week by the board. By Monday last week by the Transformation Committee. And on Sunday, we've consulted the, the ex-players, you know, in their numbers. And then on executive, we've been consulted. The whole staff of CSA was consulted on Thursday. So there's only 24 hours in a day. The concept is probably 10 days. So the consultation are still continuing, you know? And the memos have been sent to stakeholders, all the CEOs who are supposed to communicate. So if then is sitting in one meeting to engage and you know, it's not communicating when you write a memo, because we needed to communicate with the minister first, 
that took another day because we need to respect our politicians. We can play the sport. If they are not happy, they decide to take the colors, they will not be cricket South Africa. So we are respecting our, the protocol, the ministers, the parliament, we wrote to them first, this is our response strategy on Wednesday. So from Thursday where we could move after the response, it's Thursday, Friday, it's even like eight days, literally. The strategy is just eight days. Executive are consulted, the whole staff is consulted because the internal staff are our ambassadors. So those board members who are here, who are representing provinces are supposed to communicate to that. It cannot be this transformation committee thing. So they are representative of decentralized structures who are part of the board. Okay. So it's just an eight, a 88 day old baby. So we were responsive. I'm even saying I'm grateful to God for even downloading what we are discussing today that the board approved, the committee approved, the board approved, and it's just minute part of the solution to what we are facing. So we've been responsive. So if someone wants a one-on-one, -on -one, you are doing podcasts, you are doing Zooms, but the whole staff of CSA has been consulted. Okay, so I think a lot, a lot more needs to come. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, Thank you. Uh, and I think that's where we're going to, we're going to wrap up, right? Uh, Thank you. Unless some of the, the, some of the, the panelists have one last comment, but if not, I, I, I don't think so. But just raise your hands if you do. Sure. Um, what, what I'm gonna suggest, we should see where uh, lots of people have commented. And I'm gonna encourage the, the audience um, to, to tweet, firstly, racism in sports. You can tag the Kaswada Foundation. Uh, please do tag me, Ashraf Garda. You, you certainly will get comment from me. But also, um, we see where if you are able to ask them whether they can, you can copy and paste their comments in the chat room on Twitter, where not only will they tweet, but, but you can tweet from the Kaswada Foundation and attribute that to that individual person. Because I think um, it will actually help Eugenia as well to, to really understand uh, some of the comments, but also we can share that with them as well, right? Um, from the, the other point is that, um, uh, yeah, it was said at the beginning that I, I host a the Ashraf Garda show as, as a podcast and a YouTube um, combination, and we'll have it up. The same conversation will be up and running there, uh, not today, to tomorrow, maybe a couple of days from now. So I'll certainly advise you uh, on that, right? I think just time for me to say thank you to, to many people. Thank you to the Katwada Foundation a for setting all this up i think you know anything in the name of ahmad katwada speaking out against racism we, we have to be a part of it it's critically important i think the issue of racism as a as a as a, as a morally incorrect thing or something that's immoral i think is a given the question is what are we going to do about it i've heard many of the the players say we wanted to talk we didn't have the right space that word space is so so important around cultural sensitivities and what can happen so i think that's really important uh, to to the to the to the panelists, therefore, uh, JP Dumini, Robbie Peterson, uh, Monde Zondeki, thank you for your time, Dr. Mohammed Musaji as well, Dr. Eugenia Kula. Uh, I'm where are you with that very important position now heading transformation at Cricket South Africa? Thank you as well to the to the audience. Um, Mr. Gardner, do you mind if I make a final comment? And sorry, sorry, sorry to you in, in terms of all that you've said, right? Um, somebody was asking to get on, but I think Bushisi was given the, the, the nod that we need to we need to end up. I'm so sorry, but maybe just just engage on Twitter and, and we, we can talk. Okay, just uh -huh. use that hashtag united against racism, rather in sports and in check all of us. Here's the final thought for me, and there's a question. Okay, and get the other five panelists to. When I then said the answer is Rohan can high, and they said but he didn't play for Transvaal. And my answer to them was actually Rohan and I played for Transvaal. Really? I didn't have to use the word black Transvaal because for me there was only one Transvaal. It was my my Transvaal. And after him scoring the century for the black Transvaal team and four or five centuries that season, at the age of about 40 something, he represented the West Indies in the first World Cup. And the and that first World Cup where Clive Lloyd got 100, Rohan and I got 50 odd. The point I want to make. When I said Transvaal, everybody in the room, in the studio, only thought I was talking about their Transvaal. That alone is this issue of perception that had to change and must change even now. So a thank you to all of you. Thanks for the comments. Thanks for the, uh, for the, for the very important questions. A thumbs up from myself um, and, and to all of you. Let's meet again. I think the Katrada Foundation has got lots of work to do to drive this issue, not just in cricket, but racism in all sectors of society.
I thank you for your time and, and giving up your time. Most appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Aswad from CSA. Thank you. Mm -hmm.